Good morning. Will the Committee on Zoning and Planning please come to order? Short recess. Will the Committee on Zoning and Planning please come to order? Good morning. Those wishing to present oral testimony, if you have not already submitted your registration form to our Committee aide, seated to my right. Thank you, Michael. Please do so at this time. Otherwise, please raise your hand to indicate your desire to speak at the time I call for additional testifiers. Speakers will be limited to a one-minute presentation on all items before the Committee this morning. Written testimonies, including the testifier's address, email address, and phone number may be posted by the City Clerk and available to the public on the City's DocuShare website. As a courtesy, I'd like to ask that all cell phones, pagers, and other electronic devices please be turned off or placed on silent mode throughout the duration of this morning's meeting. The Chair would like to thank Committee Vice Chair Harimoto and Council Member Ann Kobayashi for helping us to fulfill quorum this morning. Chair will also like to ask that uh, when testifiers come forward to give their testimony, that all testifiers be respected and that we refrain from uh, any remarks or outbursts from the audience when people are giving their testimony before the committee this morning. Members, with no objection, the chair is going to take item number two out of order, the res resolution 14-139 confirming the appointment of Jason C. Takara as the Fire Safety Member of the Building Board of Appeals. Mr. Takara has another engagement this morning, and I'd like to bring him before the committee so that he can get on with his day as quickly as possible. So members, if there are no objections, uh, Resolution 14-139 uh, will be coming up before the committee. Mr. Takara, please be seated. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, con um, Committee Chair Anderson, Council Members, Jason Takara. Mr. Takara, did you want to make any uh, remarks in support of your nomination? I'm just honored to um, be nominated to serve on the Building Board of Appeals. Um, wanted to say thank you and um, wanted to bring the issues from the fire service into the um, Building Board of Appeals. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Takara? Okay, if not, Mr. Takara, thank you very much for being here this morning and uh, thank you for remaining. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Anyone from the administration wish to make any remarks on Mr. Takara's nomination? If not, is there anyone here with us this morning who would like to testify on the appointment of Jason Takara as the fire safety member of the Building Co Board of Appeals? If not, members, the chair recommends that Resolution 14-139 be reported out for adoption. Members, we're in discussion. If there's no discussion, do we have any objections or any reservations? Hearing none, so ordered. Resolution 14-139 will be reported out to the full council for adoption. Bill 28 CD1, rezone situated at 46-064 Alaloa Street from the B2 Community Business District with a height limit of 40 feet to the A2 Medium Density Apartment District with a height limit of 40 feet. Members, we have a proposed unilateral agreement drafted May 16th, to be attached as Exhibit B to the bill after execution and recordation that is in your meeting binders. Would the applicant and their representative please come forward. Good morning. If you please state your name for the record and proceed with your presentation. Uh, good morning, Committee Chair Anderson and Council Members. My name is Lisa Imata, agent for the applicant. Uh, here with me is Colin Yokoyama, representing the applicant. We have uh, just a minor change to the unilateral agreement, nothing um, substantive, but just uh, in the parties to the document, a uh, change of the order of the names. No deletion, no addition, just in the order. Okay. Thank you very much. Did Thank you have you. anything else that you'd like to add? No. 
Okay. Members, any questions for the applicant? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I would like to uh, just, if I may, request from the applicant that our state lawmakers representing Kaneohe State Representative Ken Ito and State Senator Joe Tokuda have asked that you continue to please apprise their office of any changes or, or any, uh, uh, the, basically just the upcoming procedure on what you folks are doing and please just keep them in the loop. They, they look forward to working with you in the community. Yeah, okay. We enjoy working with them and we'll keep them in the loop. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. For the administration. Good morning, Director. Uh, the administration uh, supports uh, the adoption uh, of the bill, and the unilateral agreement was uh, the last action that we were just waiting for for final approval. And so we, su we support the applicants. Thank you. Members, are there any questions for the Director? Okay, we don't have any registered testifiers. Is there anyone here with us this morning who'd like to testify on Bill 28? CD1. If not, members, the chair recommends that Bill 28, CD1, be reported off for passage on third reading, subject to the recordation of the unilateral agreement by the applicant. Any discussion on the chair's recommendation? If not, any reservations, objections? Hearing none, so ordered. Bill 28, CD1, has been reported out for passage on third and final reading. Uh, Ms. Imata will see you and your client uh, in July. Thank you. Uh, members, the chair would like to return to the approval of minutes. Are there any objection to approving the minutes of the May 22nd meeting of the Committee on Zoning and Planning as circulated? If there, no, if there are no objections, the minutes are approved. My apologies for overlooking that, members. Next item on our agenda is Resolution 14-140, authorizing the mayor or the mayor's designee to apply, accept, and accept funds from the United States Environmental Protection Agency under the Brownfields Assessment Grant Program to assist with the planning and implementation of transit-oriented development along the transit corridor. Members, we have a proposed hand-carried CD1 that is in your packets. The CD1 amends the title and text of the resolution to authorize only the application for the grant funds since any subsequent agreement with the EPA for the funds will be subject to, a co to council approval by subsequent resolution. Deletion of the paragraphs relating to the uncompleted application and also deletion of the attached exhibits. In, anticipa in anticipation of the submission to the Council of the completed application, addition of a new whereas paragraph stating that the application is attached as Exhibit A and incorporated by this reference. In anticipation of the submission to the Council of the completed application, addition of a new resolve paragraph approving the application and authorizing the mayor or the mayor's designee to apply for the funds pursuant to the application. There are also miscellaneous and technical and non-substantive amendments. Uh, Mr. Rue, would you please come forward for the administration? Thank you, Chair, and uh, this is Harrison Rue speaking on behalf of the administration. Um, we, we did work with uh, your staff on all the changes and we're in agreement with the changes recommended in the CD1. We, we did work with your staff on, on those changes and we're Thank in agreement you. with those changes. Okay. I should also mention that, uh, yes, the uh, uh, EPA calls this a cooperative agreement. That, that's one of the reasons why there's a multi-step application process. Uh, we did hear from them. They visited Tuesday, toured the the sites with us so along the whole transit corridor, the seven communities, and they really are looking forward to the work that we're going to be able to do. As you're aware from the application, this is primarily to help uh, smaller landowners, smaller businesses that can't afford to do the site assessments themselves. And so it, it'll be uh, strongly supportive of uh, people who want to redevelop in communities like from Waipahu to Pearl Ridge to uh, uh, Kalihi and, and Ivale. Thank you very much, Mr. Rue. Members, any questions for the administration? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Members, there are no registered testifiers for Resolution 14-140, but is there anyone here with us who would like to testify on the resolution? 
If not, members, the chair will recommend that resolution 14-140 be amended to CD1, as I outlined earlier. Any discussion on the chair's recommendation to amend? If not, any reservations, objections? Hearing none, the resolution has been amended to a CD1. Uh, members, we do not have the proposed application before us at this time. However, because of the time-sensitive the time -sensitive nature of the application, I will recommend that the resolution be reported out to the full council in the form of the amended CD1, as we just amended. And I'd like to ask that the Department of Planning and Permitting please submit the application in time for attachment uh, to the reso by way of a proposed floor draft one before our July meeting. And if we're going to have any issue with that, uh, if you could please let my office know. Thank you. Okay, members, the chair recommends that resolution 14-140 uh, CD1 be reported out for action by the council. If the completed proposed application can be submitted in a timely manner and attached to the reso by way of a proposed floor draft. Any discussion? No discussion, any reservations, objections? Hearing none so ordered, resolution 14-140 CD1 has been reported out for action by the full council. Resolution 14-142, authorizing the mayor or the mayor's designee to enter into an environmental, an intergovernmental agreement with the Hawaii Community Development Authority to study public views for urban Honolulu and to improve the Thomas Square, Blaisdell Culture and Arts neighborhood. Uh, director, would you please come forward? Thank you, Chair Anderson, members of the committee. Uh, George Atta, uh, Director of Planning. Uh, this uh, uh, resolution is uh, uh, to su support a, an agreement that uh, we reached with HCDA, and they would be helping us do a height, density, and view study uh, that uh, will then be connected to the uh, Blaisdell master planning effort that we have. So, so the HCDA is putting uh, $350,000 in their of their funds uh, to work with us in uh, providing a broader context for heights densities, and uh, you know, and it will be tied in with our uh, Blaisdell Center master planning uh, project, where we we already already have funds designated for that. So. It'll be, we'll be combining the funds and, and creating a, a larger master plan. Thank you. Members, any questions for the administration? Council Member Kobayashi. Does that plan still include a 700-foot building? Well, it's, it, the plan is to study heights, so, you know, we will study all, all of the heights. It's, it's, so, you know. <laughs> okay. But given the fact that the legislature has already passed the height ceiling, I don't know how much attention we'll put to that aspect of it. Okay, thank yeah. you. Members, any further questions for the director? Okay, thank you, director. Is there anyone with us this morning who'd like to testify on resolution 14-142? Yes, council member. Um, Good morning. Please state your morning. name for the record. My and name is Michael Daly. Um, I'm a resident of Waikiki. I've um, uh, stayed with uh, the Deoccupy um, movement at Thomas Square, and uh, I support Hawaiian independence. Um, the 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 district that we're talking about um, has a lot of uh, cultural significance for the um, for Native Hawaiians and for the Kingdom of Hawaii. The Department of Interior is here at the moment in Hawaii from Washington, D.C., and they're investigating uh, the, pos the, the uh, possibility of nation building. Uh, any, I, I, on, on the mayor's record of how he approaches Thomas Square and th that area, um, as he approaches arts and culture, as he approaches um, Hawaiian issues. I, I have no faith or trust in that man or the office uh, to have any jurisdiction in that area. That's my testimony. Thank you. Yeah. Members, any questions for the testifier? Thank you for your testimony. 
Is there anyone else here with us this morning who'd like to testify on resolution 14-142? If not, members, the chair recommends that resolution 14-142 be reported out for adoption. Any discussion? Any reservations? Objections? Hearing none so ordered, resolution 14-142 has been reported out for adoption. Members, the chair is going to take up uh, items number five, six, seven, and eight together as they all pertain to the same subject matter. Uh, members, but we are going to need to sunshine uh, bills 45 and 46 onto the agenda as well as they passed first reading earlier this morning. And upon doing that, members, I would like to take up uh, Resolution 14-117, Bill 42, Bill 43, Bill 44, and Bill 45 and Bill 46 all at the same time. Okay. okay. So may I have a motion to add Bill 45, 2014, to the agenda at this time? Mr. Chai, so moved. Okay. Been moved by Vice Chair Harimoto, seconded by Council Member Kobayashi. Are there any objections? Hearing none, so ordered. Bill 45 has been added to the agenda. May I have a motion to add Bill 46 to the agenda at this time? Mr. Chair, I will again so move. Second. Moved by Vice Chair Harimoto, seconded by Council Member Kobayashi. Are there any objections? Hearing none, so ordered. Bill 46 has also been added to the agenda. Thank you very much, members. Is the Director of the Mayor's Office of Culture and the Arts present with us this morning? Aloha, Auntie. If you could please, uh, Auntie, offer us uh, in Oli before we get started on these items this morning, we'd greatly appreciate it. Thank you. This is the Oli Aloha. Welcome, everybody. I will be speaking of the lehua. Of course, we know it's very soft, delicate flower, and also the hala that is very strong and pungent, and how separately they're beautiful. But when you twine the both of them in a form of a lay, how much more beautiful it is. Oh, now O ka uno ia e ano ine ne ho yo taiti mai ai ti mai no oi ti pu mai no me ke aloha e aloha e aloha e aloha e aloha kako aloha everyone. Aloha. Mahalo nui, Auntie. Okay, members, Bill 42, prohibiting, subject to exceptions, persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in the Waikiki Special District. Bill 43, prohibiting urinating and defecating in public with the Waiki within the Waikiki Special District. Bill 44, prohibiting, subject to exceptions, persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in the downtown Honolulu and Chinatown areas. Bill 45, relating to public sidewalks. And Bill 46, relating to urinating and defecating in public. Also, Resolution 14117, proposing land use ordinance amendments relating to the Waikiki Special District. Would uh, the administration please come forward? Good morning, Chair Anderson. Good morning, members of the committee. 
Um, for the record, I am Georgette Deemer. I'm the Deputy Managing Director. Um, I have comments this morning on Bill 42 and 43, and I'm, I'll be available for questions on 44, 45, and 46. Um, as you know, the, the administration and the City Council, we've all been working very hard to address homelessness. And uh, we recognize that the solution uh, is a combination of many different things, but one of the tools that we have been looking at uh, that is that are in place in other cities has been the sit lie law uh, bill 42 is modeled after the sit lie law in Seattle uh, one of the major differences though is that the Seattle prohibition is only effective between 7 a.m. and 9 p.m. in certain commercial areas and bill 42 proposes a 24-hour round-the-clock prohibition in the Waikiki special district only um, this 24-hour prohibition uh, we believe is justifiable because of the numerous businesses um, that and uh, commercial operations that are open 24 hours in Waikiki, um, and we st cite specific examples in the bill. Um, and because of this more narrowly defined geographic area, and because the hours of the sit lie prohibition are tied to the level of pedestrian activity on the public sidewalks, and whether or not businesses are open that would attract pedestrian traffic, uh, we believe that this bill will withstand um, a constitutional challenge and is on fairly solid ground. Um, why did we choose Waikiki? Of course, as, as we all know, Waikiki is one of the state's major economic drivers. Uh, the mayor has been receiving um, increased complaints from visitors, as I'm sure you have, and I know the visitor industry has, um, on the homelessness issue. Um, it's a very uh, it's a very sad um, situation. Um, we decided to propose the sit lie bill as a pilot only in Waikiki um, to see how it works, um, to see what the, the consequences of the bill might be, and if successful, we would certainly look to expanding to other critical areas. Um, I would also like to add that the administration does know that this bill must and should work in tandem with making sure that there is adequate shelter available and ultimately permanent housing. Um, according to our Office of Housing, um, there, there should be enough shelter space available in Honolulu that could accept the number of chronically homeless in Waikiki. And in addition, as you know, there is money in the budget um, to implement housing first as quickly as possible. Um, we anticipate providing rental units for housing first um, as early as this August. Um, and with that, um, shall I go on to Bill 43? Please do. Okay. Uh, Bill 43 um, prohibits urinating or defecating in a public place within the Waikiki Special District. Um, of course, uh, there is an exception for situations in which, the, in which the person suffers a medical condition which would be verified by a physician. Um, basically, this is a public health and sanitation issue. Um, but there should also, um, but we, we do also believe that there should be public bathrooms available in the enforcement area. Um, for Waikiki, there are public ba bathrooms in the Waikiki Special District, um, and we also do have money in the fiscal year 15 budget for increased cleaning and to keep a bathroom open beyond regular closure hours. Uh, we would like to work with the Waikiki visitor industry to implement this, um, this program. Um, so with that, um, I am available for the questions on the other bills as well. Thank you very much. Um, what is the administration's uh, position on Bill 44? Um, yes, Bill 44, uh, the administration does support the intent of this bill, but we would like to raise some concerns. Um, as you know, Chinatown also has a critical homelessness problem, and it is an area that needs assistance. Um, but we do, we are concerned that the geographic area that is outlined in the bill is, is rather broad. Um, and we don't know or don't believe that there may be businesses open uh, around the clock in this area um, in which there would be pedestrian traffic on the sidewalks 24 hours to warrant a prohibition effective for 24 hours. Um, we did research businesses in Waikiki and gave specific examples. Um, but in this particular bill, there's no factual basis in Bill 44 to support a 24-7 ban. Does the administration have a position on Bill 45 and Bill 46? Uh, yes, we do. Uh, of course, um, we also in support the intent of these bills. Um, uh, we do have a, a very serious concern, though, 
Um, you know, the sit lie ordinance is really not a one size fits all kind of kind of law. Um, any ban or prohibition on sitting and lying does need to be tied to pedestrian safety, um, and it should be tied to the amount of pedestrian activity on the sidewalk and the time period that the pedestrian activity occurs on the sidewalks. And this will vary from community to community. Um, and if this ban were to be applied island-wide, um, we are concerned that there could be a, a, a legal challenge to it. Um, as you're aware, uh, the Seattle law applies only to certain commercial areas in the city. Um, and that is why we think Waikiki does have the best chance of withstanding this kind of challenge. Um, in terms of the um, island-wide public urination and defecation bill, um, again, we support the, the bill's intent. Um, obviously, this is a, a public health area, a public health hazard in any area of the island, but we are concerned, again, about a challenge if there are no public restroom facilities available in the area. Um, so, you know, there are places in, on Oahu where um, there aren't accessible public facilities nearby. Um, so we do ask that you consider passing Bill 42 and 43, um, that we, um, because we do have a significant problem in Waikiki. Um, we don't want to um, have a situation where our economic driver is, is hampered. Um, that would impact all of us. Uh, we believe that these bills will withstand constitutional challenge, that they're on solid ground, and we would like to work with the council, if these bills are successful, uh, to expand to other areas in the future. Okay. Thank you. We look forward to working with the administration on, on all of these items. Okay. Um, is the uh, corporation council present? Yes. And also is the uh, Office of Culture and Arts Director present as well? Good morning, Don Sperlin, Deputy Corporation Counsel. Good morning. Hi. Introduce. Good morning. Laura Yoshida, Deputy Corporation Counsel. Good morning. Misty Kilai, Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Culture and the Arts. Thank you, ladies, very much for being here this morning. Uh, Director Kilai, could you please uh, talk to the committee about the uh, law of the splintered paddle? I'd also like you to give your expertise on the law, uh, what it meant, and what it means today, if you will. And then I'd like a legal, uh, I'd also like a, a legal um, definition from the Office of the Corporation Council. Kana vai ma malahoi. Kana vai ma malahoi, the law of the splintered paddle. I would like to olelo Hawaii and read it to you and translate, if I may. Aye. Kana na vai ma malahoi, the law of the splintered paddle. Ina kanaka, o people. E ma lama oko ikeakua, honor thy God. Ae ma mala ko ike kanaka nui. Ameka kanaka iki, respect alike, both the great people and the humble people. Eheleka ele makule, kaluahine, ameka kama. May everyone, man, women, elderly, and children, amoi ke ala, be free and go forth, lay on the path. A ohe mea nana e hoopilikia, without fear of harm. Heva no make. Break this law and die. Written by Aliinui Kamehameha Ekahi. Now, from my understanding, and of course, this is from my kupuna, and I'm a graduate of Kamehameha schools, this uh, law came to be, Kamehameha, I believe, in the early 1700s. 80s, young warrior, fierce young Hawaiian warrior. They were battling in his canoe with his men on the Hilo side, Hawaii Island, and they were looking for a place to rest. So with his men in their war canoe, coming around Kea outside, Puna side, looking for a place to rest, saw these fishermen fishing with their families. 
So Kamehameha being all feisty and everything, warrior, he went over there to attack them. And in this attack, Kamehameha Eka, his foot got stuck in a, a puka in the lava. And the fisherman grabbed the paddle and cracked him a good one, almost killing him, splintered the plat paddle. And he could have killed Kamehameha, but the fisherman didn't. He let Kamehameha go. Years later, Kamehameha saw these fishermen, and he's Ali. He could have had them killed on the spot, but he did not. Because not only he was fierce, he was very compassionate. He loved his people. So he, my bad, he realized his error, his mistake. So I believe this law was written to protect citizens from war, from attack. That's it. Thank you very much. Aye. Mahalo nui. Thank you. Could we hear from the Office of the Corporation Council as to how uh, this law may or may not be applied to any of the items that are before uh, the committee at this time? Chair, during Bill 59, which was an earlier bill prohibiting lying on the sidewalk, I was called up and asked a similar question, and I believe I already I had stated on the record um, that this the law of the splintered paddle was a matter before Judge Seabright in this uh, in the deoccupy cases. The deoccupy individuals had challenged the uh, what we call the SPO and the SNO law, and it stated that that those laws violated the law of the splintered paddle. In the judge's ruling, which was in the record, um, the judge stated that the law of the splintered paddle is not self-executing, means you don't have a basis for a lawsuit, and that it's merely a provision which vests power in the state, not individuals, to provide for the safety of the people from crimes against persons and property. That, that's all it does. It, it just gives power to the state. So it's, it's not, when he says self-executing, it's not for individuals to bring individual lawsuits. So the judge ruled that Kanavai Mama Lahoi does not apply in the case of Bill 59? Yes, yes. And it is the opinion of the Corporation Council that the law does not apply either to any of the measures that are before the committee this morning? Uh, based on the court's ruling, that's Based on the court's ruling, that's it, it does not apply to any of the measures before us this morning yes. either. Members, do we have any questions for the administration at this time? Uh, Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I guess my questions are mainly for the um, Deputy Managing Director. Um, and I'll just preface my questions with saying that I think in past uh, discussions about the prior bill, I think my position opposing these kinds of bills are well known. So with that leading into this, um, so as we go into this discussion about all of these bills, uh, I just want to lay some things on the table. So if you could clarify first, um, what is the definition of sidewalk? Because we're making sitting and lying on sidewalks uh, illegal. Is that a question you can answer? Um, it's, a, I think it's, it's, in it's in the bill. I have it right here, but I, I want to be sure everybody understands what we're talking about. or for the Deputy Corporation Council. Um, Council Member Harimoto, um, within Bill 4042, um, there is a definition of public sidewalk, uh, which states, uh, means a publicly owned or maintained sidewalk as defined in section 29-1.1 and includes a replacement sidewalk as defined in that section. Yes, but my question was, what is sidewalk? Uh, council member, I don't have 29-1.1. Okay. Okay, so I have the, I'll, I'll read. I just wanted to get it on the table so everybody understands what the scope of this proposal is. So let me just read it. Sidewalk means portion of a street between the curb line or the pavement of a roadway and the adjacent private or public property line whichever case the case may be intended for the use of pedestrians 
and it goes on. But that's a key part. So I just want everybody to understand what the scope is. Um, so my next question is, so what, is, what, what are the penalties um, should this pass? It's a petty, it, Go it's ahead. A petty misdemeanor, um, up to a $1,000 fine, and up to 30 days in jail. As with all your other, um, I think the majority of your other ordinances have the same penalty, a petty misdemeanor. Okay, so several questions related to that. So, um, first, let me say, I understand why the mayor is proposing a limited area of Waikiki, and it, I believe, largely relates to the enforcement issue of um, manpower. Is, is that correct? Or one of the issues, I should say, because it's going to take some manpower and some resources to enforce, correct? Well, so. manpower power is certainly, you know, a, a need, um, but the limitation to the Waikiki Special District um, relates to, um, the prohibition relates to the uh, businesses that attract pedestrian safety. Yes, so I understand that. So my question relates to the manpower issues and costs to enforce, because again, I stated before, I don't believe in making laws if we're not going to enforce them. So have you assessed the cost, both in terms of money and manpower, to May enforce? I refer to um, the police department on that question? Uh, Mr. Chair, sure. would that be okay? Referring you to have the floor, sir. Okay, sure. Uh, Vice Chair, please call whoever you deem necessary. Okay, so if we could ask HPD to answer the question. Hi, good morning. If you could um, sit. We need to get you on the, the uh, speaker. <laughs> Hi, good morning. Lisa Mann, the acting major in Waikiki. So the yes. question is, talking about manpower, how would we enforce Yes, the assuming the Waikiki ban is mm -hmm. in place, what is the cost in terms of manpower and uh, perhaps funding to enforce the law? Well, we, we do have manpower available. We have to make some adjustments when it comes to assigning the manpower, but it also should be noted that much of our enforcement now is spent on people in the area who are creating, um, how do I say this, problem? I don't want to say problems, but there are a lot of calls that we receive are to respond to deal with um, individuals that are blocking doors or maybe there's some harassment case or whatever it may be. So some of the manpower, same manpower dealing with some of the same people, and I'm not saying that all the same people are sitting and laying on the sidewalks, but I'm just saying it would take away some of the efforts we're doing currently to address some of the problems. Okay, so you're not anticipating any additional resources? No, we're not. Okay, thank you. Uh, so actually, while you're there, a related question then. So if there is someone who is lying or sitting on the sidewalk or urinating and defecating, uh, of course we know that you actually have to observe this happening. Mm -hmm. um, then what would you do? Well, the sitting or lying, we'd ask them to, to stop what they're doing, to stop mm -hmm. their behavior and get up. <laughs> so they could just get up and mm -hmm. move along? Mm -hmm. And if you see them again? My understanding is that they do not stop the behavior when asked. At that point, we can cite them or arrest them. Okay, so what happens when you arrest a person for this kind of infraction? It's treated as a, a petty misdemeanor. Okay, Same thing we, we would do now. If so we you take them to the police station? Yes. Uh, they would be charged with the offense and a bail would be set, or they would have to appear in court the next day if they're not able to post bail. Okay, so I'm assuming these, these people will not have money for bail, so they go to jail. Is that correct? I cannot answer that question. I'm not saying that they all don't have money. Okay, well, let's assume they don't have okay. money. Then they would go to jail then? Overnight, yes, before they appear in court. They have okay. a right to appear before the judge. So in similar cases, um, if, if they don't have the money for a fine or a bail or mm -hmm. whatever it is, um, typically would they then be sentenced to jail time? That's up to the judge, not normally on the first offense, but I don't want to talk about that. That's not our part. We, like I said, I we, just, we take it to a certain point. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to understand the process. Um, so if I could go back to Deputy Managing Director. You talked about modeling this after Seattle. Um, can you talk about the successes of the law in Seattle? 
Well, my understanding is that the law in Seattle, um, th th while there may not be many arrests, uh, the fact that the law exists um, is um, a tool that the police can use. Um, and when they do talk to people on the that are lying or sitting on the sidewalk in these commercial districts, the people do move along. Do we know if their homeless situation is as um, escalated as ours is currently? I don't know. I okay. don't believe so, but I can't say that for a fact. Okay, so we don't know how much improvement was made by this law or how, how effective it really was. I only have anecdotal stories. Um, I have heard that there is an improvement, um, but again, that's anecdotal. Mm -hmm. And when was this law enacted in Seattle? I think it was something like 2009 or something like that. I think I read 2009. I don't know. Okay, so I was in Seattle last year in this the downtown area, and I did see homeless people lying on the side. So, you know, I, that leads me to ask how effective do we believe this kind of law would be? Um, so the related question then is, do we know where their homeless people went, assuming they moved off the sidewalks? I don't know where they went. It was enacted in 1993. Oh, okay, well, that's even worse. Okay, so I can only tell you my observation on my trip to Seattle, and I did see homeless people lying on the side on the sidewalks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we don't know how effective the law was. We don't know where the people went. We don't know what the situation was when they enacted the law. So you know, I'm not sure why we say it was effective. Um, you know, I'm just trying to establish some some the groundwork here. Um, and it was only in specified areas of the city, right? Uh, commercial districts, yes. Certain, mm -hmm. certain commercial districts. So we don't know if the homeless moved somewhere else and the problem just moved elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, changing subjects now. You mentioned homeless, the, the housing first issue. And uh, you stated that perhaps as early as August? Yes. So um, unfortunately, I didn't get my briefing from the administration yet about the plans, but um, what is the scope of the August target date? Is it, you know, how many units, how many people we're targeting? Right. Um, the August uh, uh, initiative um, relates to the $3 million that was appropriated uh, for Housing First. It uh, it includes, to my understanding, about one point of of that three million. There is about one point two million uh, for rental housing vouchers, um, and the rest would be in administrative services and support wraparound services. Do we know how many homeless people we are? Um, I believe it's about it's one hundred and ten units would be available in August. Uh, if we work with, um, we're, we're trying to work with uh, private property owners who may have rental units available. So, Mr. Chap, sorry, I don't want to belabor this, but I'm just trying to determine, as you know, my position was mm -hmm. that we cannot create more of these laws unless we have these support systems in place. Understood. So I'm trying to correlate this. Mm -hmm. So we want to pass this law, but we're not sure when we're going to have the support in place and to what extent the support will be in place. Um, good morning, June Yang, Executive Director for the Mayor's Office of Housing. Uh, the the plan as as going through um, our administration is to have the uh, the funding available as soon as possible. So we're working on the the request for proposals as we speak, and we're working within the the community serv service providers to provide rental services, rental uh, vouchers with uh, wraparound services, as as you've already heard. Um, the target is uh, approximately 100, 100 individuals in these areas of uh, downtown Chinatown, Waikiki, and the Leeward Coast. These are our priority areas. So um, we are expecting to focus a lot of our resources in this, in this place. Um, through the point in time count, we know that it's approximately 50 to 60 chronically homeless individuals in Waikiki. 
um, most of our services combined with the services that are being provided by the RFP in the state will be able to help our chronically homeless in, on, on the streets there. Um, the, one of the tools that we are using at this point, uh, the Hale Omalama effort, is to do a, um, a community or a coordinated assessment. This is a common assessment tool to see what are, the need, what are the needs for the homeless that are on the street right now. From that, we are able to find if housing first is the right, correct intervention, or if there are other housing interventions that are necessary. What we are finding is that housing first is the correct intervention for the majority of those who are in this area, uh, in downtown Chinatown and in Waikiki. We're looking at, uh, I think, the most recent numbers, approximately 40% of those who are on the street, housing first is the correct intervention. We're not going to say everyone fits that model um, as this specific. If we're talking about a philosophy of housing first, we, we agree that housing first as a philosophy is the correct way to approach it as well. But for these funds, we're talking about as a resource, those who fit the, mo the highest need, housing first as a program that we in the state are doing, yes, it does fit for uh, approximately 40, a little bit over 40%. Thank you for that. I think from a high level, that's a great plan. Um, by the way, I should mention, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in housing first. Yes, um, that is a great program, absolutely the right thing to do. And I should mention also, if you haven't watched 60 Minutes uh, two Sundays ago, that was a fantastic explanation of how good Housing First yes, is. Sir. So that's, that's great. But going back to my question, so if we're saying we're gonna, we, we want to pass this law to make lying and sitting on the sidewalk illegal, Again, my, my question really is, so we are going to ramp up support in August. I mean, I want to know what, is, what, what will be in place in August and how many homeless people we can help in August. I'm not talking about what the goal is a year, two years, three years down the road. Um, so I'm, I'm just talking when you start in August. Sure. Um, we are in the process of, of making sure that the RFP comes out. Uh, that, that, comes, that will be coming through the Department of Community Services, so I will let the director, uh, she's not available at this point, but I'll, I'll have her come in and, uh, and she can speak to, to the RFP itself. But what we are doing at this point, um, we will have the RFP out and we'll have the community services, uh, the service providers working uh, in this area as fast as possible. The funding is only available for one year, and that tells us that $3 million need to be spent out by the end of uh, the fiscal year. We are trying to ramp up to ensure that we can get as many people into housing as fast as possible. So we are uh, wanting to work with landlords, those who work with our, our service provider agencies, um, and, and into the community as a whole. So we, we are beginning the process within uh, Department of Criminal Services, as, uh, along with my office, to allow for um, calls in to work with landlords to see if we, we can provide spaces, uh, rental spaces, as, as fast as once the money is available to us. Um, Council Member, also, I know you have service providers here this morning as well, but my understanding is that there also is shelter space currently available now um, to house um, the, was it 50 to 60 chronically homeless in Waikiki? Okay, but what I'm hearing is that the RFP isn't even out yet, and we know how long the RFP process takes. So when you say you're starting in August, I'm not hearing that's a realistic start date. So I do have large concerns. Well, um, I, I would, uh, we know that the RFP will be coming out very, very soon. Uh, I can't give you the date um, until I have a, an opportunity to, to let the director uh, speak on that but it will be coming out very, very shortly, meaning that um, we are expecting to uh, be able to hit the street um, and have it available by that August 1st deadline is, is what we're pushing for. To get the RFP out, to have... No, and have the, the and person, have somebody, somebody in line. And, somebody and selected ready. and contracted we are, by we're, August? We're, we're pushing for it, yes, we are. Wow, that's a miracle. <laughs> we're, we're, we're working as hard as we can to get that done. Okay, um, let me just ask, I guess, my final questions for now. Um, you know, we haven't heard testimony yet, but I've read them all. And uh, I'm gonna, I will propose a compromise on this. Uh, 
but let me just ask right now. I understand the urgency of the situation in Waikiki. I fully understand the concerns of the businesses and hotels in Waikiki. I, I agree we need to do something quickly. Um, but again, I, I, you know, I'll propose a compromise. But my question right now is, um, you talked about perhaps a, getting some of the businesses involved and through the testimony, written testimony, some of the businesses in Waikiki talks about we need a community and a partnership to make this work. So do we have the Chamber of Commerce, the Waikiki Improvement Association, the businesses in Waikiki on board, fully committed to partner with us and not saying, city, take care of this? Do we have commitments from the businesses to be our partner in this? Council Member, I, I know that, that they are here as well this morning, so I know they, they can are, speak but for themselves. You. But I will tell you that uh, we have been meeting with the visitor industry, including the hotel operators, uh, on a regular basis. Um, we believe we already have a working relationship with them, um, and we are um, committed to that partnership. Okay, no, and, I they, and they as well have, have said they would like to work with us. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. And I understand there's a good working relationship. I understand there's a partnership. But I guess I should rephrase my question to be more specific. So what skin in the game did they commit to? To helping the homeless to not be on the streets. Otherwise, it's just, it's a problem. City, take care of it. You fund it. You find the resources. So that's my question. Very, very pointedly. Do we have commitments of that sort from any? any? I, I think I th they, should, they should speak to that. I, I would like to hear them, but I'm asking you as the administration saying you want to do this. Do we have any commitments? Uh, only the, the commitment to work with us. Okay, I won't belabor <laughs> the point. I guess that means no. So, um, Mr. Chair, thank you. I appreciate the flexibility. Thank you very much. Um, one moment. Um, Mr. Yang, this council has, a point, has uh, appropriated some $47 million to assist with affordable housing as well as homelessness, yes? That's, um, the, the budget was passed by the council, yes. Okay. Additionally, uh, this council has committed to the administration to partner with the administration in implementing a solid housing first initiative as well as providing homes for working ho or providing shelter for working homeless as well as for homeless families yes mm. um, I believe that's and and for for the the budget budgetary side this is all going through the Department of Community Services so correct I will I'll, I will um, I'll have uh, the the director could speak to that a little better than I can can you explain to us uh, what your department will be doing as far as working with the mayor Absolutely. Uh, uh, working are, with the mayor and utilizing these funds that the council has we, appropriated. Uh, from my position, our, our, uh, my position here is to allow for the, the policy uh, mm -hmm. on, on Housing First, on our homeless initiatives uh, across the county. So working together with the state and the city, with the federal programs, um, trying to in ensure that our initiatives are moving forward in the right direction. That's, uh, that's the, the Office of the Housing uh, position on, on homelessness. Okay. Thank you very much, Mr. Yang. Council Member Manor? Just a follow-up. Uh, as you know, uh, Director, uh, you've been out to uh, Waipahu, which, which is a community that I represent, and we've got problems of homeless encampments uh, in the uh, White Plantation Village area. Yes. Totally unacceptable. Um, and community leaders, including uh, members of the Waipahu Neighborhood Board, are very concerned about um, having uh, the homeless out there relocated. So given your efforts to try to um, provide uh, housing, opportunities and services to the homeless uh, that you hope to be able to get off the ground by August. Uh, I've got a Waipahu Neighborhood Board meeting tonight. Can I report back to them that there is a, a good likelihood that um, given your efforts that, uh, that the homeless who are out there in Waipahu can start to be relocated to more acceptable surroundings? We, through the uh, coordinated assessment process, we're able to ensure that, try to funnel the right resources to the people that are, are, are needing them. Um, what we've done at this point, uh, and we have our service providers, a couple of them in the room, uh, they've, they have um, agreed to do assessments in the Leeward Region 1 or Region 2 area, uh, in the downtown urban Honolulu area. And what, we've, what we are able to do then is 
to connect the resources to those individuals. Uh, what we can do, what I can do, if, if it's not being done at this point, I can talk to our service providers to see if we can assess those who are in the, the Hans Larange and the Waipahu Cultural Gardens area to ensure that they are a part of this um, assessment and are going to be connected to the correct resources. Um, I know at, uh, as a fact that our service providers go to these areas every week to, to meet with the homeless there to see if there are uh, any pr uh, services that they can meet with uh, health-wise um, and others uh, every week. So um, if we are able to provide housing or other shelter services, uh, I know that they're doing it right now. Uh, regarding the housing first, if we're able to, we're going to try. Uh, question for the uh, Deputy Managing Director. Um, I, I just wanted you to clarify again the fact that um, one of the key reasons why the administration's proposal focuses or is limited to Waikiki is because of the fact that uh, if we were to propose expanding the prohibitions to uh, other areas, that that could raise the significant legal issues and problems. Is that correct? That is correct, and it, it, it relates to the time period that the prohibition is in effect. Right, okay. So I, one final follow-up with the uh, Deputy Corporation Council. Uh, I know that with respect to uh, the SIDLI ordinances um, that um, the Ninth Circuit has uh, ruled that uh, there need to be designated time and geographic boundary restrictions. The question I want to ask you is, with respect to the uh, other bills that we're considering that apply to the um, urinating and defecating, do uh, the same or similar legal standards or tests apply to, to those kinds of ordinances or proposals as well? Just generally speaking. Okay. Um, regarding the urinating and defecating, um, essentially, um, Yes, uh, you, you take the, the same type of restrictions, um, they, they do generally apply. So if you're going to be looking at um, those type of restrictions and placing, because it is a basic bodily function, and you're putting those type of restrictions and basically criminalizing that type of um, function, um, yes. Yeah, the answer is yes. So you, you have to be very careful when um, putting that type of um, ordinance in place. Okay, so just real briefly, um, in, in looking at the, uh, the bills relating to uh, urinating and defecating, what, what are the tests? If the courts look at, if there's a legal challenge to uh, those kinds of measures, mm -hmm. what, what, what tests or standards will the court look at? Council member, may I interject? Um, I'd like to suggest we go in an exec session. Okay, well oh, that's fine. I just wanted to get clarified. Not not really opining on this particular, on these particular bills, but in terms of case precedent, uh, you know, what tests, just the basic tests that would apply in general to any measures that are similar to what's being proposed here. But if you, if court counsel feels uncomfortable in regards to rendering, uh, providing input uh, at this time, and you feel we need to go into executive session, I'm not requesting executive session at this time. I just, I've done some research, so I'm somewhat familiar with it. I, I just thought that it would be helpful for you to provide that input for the edification of the other council members. So, that's fine. Council Member Kobayashi. Thank you. Um, for the housing director, uh, on, in your housing first program where you go around to different landlords to look for um, vacant or available or willing to rent to the housing first program, um, will there be a minimum of units per building? Or what if there's just one in, in a building? Are you setting a minimum? Well, the scattered site model uh, doesn't set a minimum or a maximum. Uh, okay. What, as a scattered site model that we've, we're choosing, um, we could do a project-based type. Mm -hmm. um, specific site for housing first right uh, the other option and for um, for a program like ours uh, we would do a scatter site in the community we wouldn't m mandate anything like that it would be uh, a relationship with the landlord and uh, the service provider um, speaking on how can we uh, utilize some of the space in your building if it's a, a large building so um, as just a scattered site model, we wouldn't mandate 10% or 50% in any way like that. So even if there's one unit in a building and another unit in another building, you you would still send the services to that one unit? The, Is the, that efficient? The, 
it, it is connecting the the homeless individual to we're talking about if we're talking because about ta efficiencies I mean, housing first. sure yeah, if, we're, uh -huh. if we're talking about uh, property management efficiencies um, I think a, a property manager would probably be better uh, to speak on on that but a building would create efficiencies in itself but if we're talking about providing the services for the individual and to ensure that they're going to be successfully housed and stay in um, with all the services wrapped around them. Mm -hmm. uh, being a part of the community is a part of the, the healing solution. Right. So um, it can be one in one building over here, one in a low rise over here, and yet the, the, the case manager and the services will be provided to them, yes. Yeah, I, I mean, your administration keeps arguing for that, the scattered site rather than a building. And um, I, I just worry about the, the one in one building, one down, you know, one across town in another building, that they get the same uh, services that they should, that are required by Housing First. And it'll be required by, um, it'll be required by the community that... Well, if you're going in the Housing First model, you have to follow mm -hmm. that model. That's right. Mm -hmm. So you will be doing that. Um, uh, we will be requiring that the services will be will be given to each of the individuals that okay. are part of Housing First. Yes. Okay. And then for the um, on this, if Bill, mm -hmm. if I can understand the mayor wanting to um, focus on Waikiki, but then um, I wasn't clear about your support for the Chinatown downtown, which goes all the way to Ward Avenue. Mm -hmm. The concern on, on that bill is that um, there aren't businesses open 24-7 in all of that area, so that there would be difficulty in um, justifying a 24-7 prohibition on sitting lying because there isn't pedestrian traffic uh, on those but sidewalks. But what if it's less? What if you do 12 hours or... That is something that um, we could look at. I mean, would you support that or? I, I mean, the reason is, you know, I have the area in between, Makali, Mo'ili, Ili, and I think it's very unfair that this area would be carved out, which has a great deal of businesses, mm -hmm. a, a lot of businesses and a lot of homeless people. And you're, you seem to be carving out um, an area surrounding uh, Makali, Mo'ili'ili, Ili, Manoa, Kapahulu, um, which I think I is very unfair. And I, you know, I could have uh, introduced legislation to say, you know, carry this program over into Mo'ili'ili Mo Ili because it's just walking distance from Waikiki. But I didn't want to do that to other districts. So, I would, I would really like to know the support of the administration on doing that to Makali, Mo'ili'ili, Ili, Kapahulu, and Ka Kaka'ako, that whole area. St. Louis Heights, there are a lot of homeless in St. Louis Heights, okay. the bottom of. So I'd like to know the administration's position on doing that. I understand, Council Member, we will um, discuss that and get back to you. Okay, thank you. Council Chair Martin. Thank you, Chairman. Sorry for being late. I just have a few generic questions with regards to, um, and it's related to these measures, but in general on the mayor's overall comprehensive strategy with regards to this issue. Uh, in the mayor's uh, uh, efforts to uh, prioritize the Waikiki district, I can uh, recognize, we all recognize that it's the economic engine that drives our state. And the uh, mayor's efforts to move these initiatives forward as well as to alleviate uh, the issue in Waikiki. Did he ask the industry to dedicate a set amount of units for the scattered site housing first concept? No, I don't believe he has asked specifically for that. Why not? Um, I don't know, I'll have to get back to you on that. The only reason I ask is that, if you well remembered, uh, the mayor had proposed a dollar increase to the resort and hotel property residential rate. This council lowered that rate by 50 cents 
in response to some of the concerns from the industry. Additionally, when the mayor had proposed increasing it to the amount that he recommended, he uh, also uh, offered a package to the Waikiki industry to deal with this particular issue. The council, uh, of course, uh, did consult with the industry, did not accept that proposal, but at the same time increased the budget by $32 million, more than what the mayor had requested, primarily to deal with that problem. So I guess, I guess from my position is that, you know, I think some of the, and, and it follows up with some of the questions that uh, Council Member Harimoto had asked. What is the commitment from the private sector, from the tourism industry with regards to assisting the city in alleviating this problem? Mm -hmm. Have any, have you got any commitments? Um, I don't believe we have gotten specific commitments, but we do have a commitment from the industry to work with the city. And if they are able to say something specific today, I don't know. I see Max Soyd here. I know Max is willing to give up 10 to 12 units in his uh, massive portfolio of outrigger properties for a scattered site uh, concept. Max, right, Max? I know he's coming up later. I'm I probably not going to be here, but thank you for your commitment, Max. Let me ask this, this uh, a follow-up question in regards to that, or you want me to stop already? <laughs> I guess in general, I guess, you know, in these packages uh, of, well, this legislation that are being considered now, I think, um, you know, and actually uh, I was watching this from my office and actually I came in because of uh, some of the questions that Council Member Harimoto had asked. But do you see um, all of the bills that the, are being considered by this committee as the answer? to this particular problem, or is it part of a consolidated package? All of the bills? Yeah. No, the bills, in relative to the problem, how, how do you foresee these bills? Is the council adopting these bills going to alleviate the issue that we're facing um, in isolation? Chair, I think that the preference of the administration would be to start with Waikiki. Um, we do, as mentioned, uh, the other bills uh, may face constitutional challenges. Um, if we were to include Waikiki in those bills and those bills were not able to go forward, then we would not have a sit lie bill. So if we were to start with Waikiki, see how it works, and then look to um, other areas, um, if we can see what the consequences of those, bill, those bills are, and what's, if it is indeed successful. Okay. So give, given your response, and being that you're the administration's representative, Let's say at the end of the day, we're only able to adopt legislation pertaining to the Waikiki Special District. Now, some of the concerns of the members and as well as people in the community, if we only adopt legislation in Waikiki, then the problem is going to spread to other communities. Given that, that possible scenario, hopefully it will not occur, then will the administration commit to, to concentrating its housing first philosophy solely in Waikiki? so that they don't spread the wealth to other communities? The housing first, um, yeah. you know, I have not, uh, I don't know what the mayor's position is, is okay. that, well, is, is on that. This is still early in the process, but I think those type of questions, I think all of the members, you know, I mean, I live in rural Oahu, the chances of them coming all the way out to rural Oahu, there is, there is a possibility. I got beachfront property too, mm -hmm. you know, and but some of the neighboring communities I would think have greater concerns, so. You know, if it's something that you can discuss internally amongst the, your executive team, and then as the he hearings proceed, we would like more definitive responses. Understood. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very, thank you very much, Chair. Anyone else have any questions uh, for the administration at this time? Uh, Council Member Fukunaga. Perhaps to uh, <coughs> Yang. You know, I know that um, many of the, the different neighborhoods um, have expressed concerns, you know, about the impact of the um, Bills 42-43 pilot project approach, you know, and, and areas that already have a lot of homeless residents are especially uh, concerned. Uh, one thing that, you know, um, we would like to kind of see what the city's position is going to be with respect to uh, implementing, you know, alternative forms of housing very quickly is, um, say, in downtown Chinatown, we know that the likelihood of uh, vacant units, you know, that um, are otherwise available to house chronic mentally, 
chronically homeless with mental health challenges and substance abuse challenges is going to be fairly small. And we have, uh, you know, included some funding to expedite, you know, what the city and uh, government agencies and private sector can do to expand on um, the services of existing providers. Would the administration be likely to proceed with the same uh, speed, you know, in implementing those kinds of solutions as well as the housing first types of rental vouchers? Because, you know, I think from our standpoint, if you're looking at um, expedited housing choices, you know, by August, then we would want to see the same type of, you know, expedited um, uh, assistance for alternative housing for those populations that we know are going to be very difficult to house on a scattered site basis. Well, let me um, allow uh, most of those programs that you're speaking of come through our Department of Community Services, and our director is here to, to be able to answer those questions. So I'll, I'll um, have Pam Whitty Oakland, Director of Pam okay. Whitty Oakland, come up. Will that be okay, Chair? That'd be fine. Thank you, Pam. Thank you Dr. Yang. Good morning, um, Chair Anderson, Chair Martin, committee members, Pam Whitty, Oakland Department of Community Services. I um, apologize for being a little bit tardy to this meeting, but if I could answer, I'll speak to Councilmember Fukunaga's question about efforts to ex expedite. Um, and if I could kind of go back to a statement that was made earlier about the status of the RFP. We have an RFP that will be out very shortly. We do acknowledge that it's going to take us uh, probably 60 to 90 days to contract. We're aware of that. So what we are doing is working with community providers, the service providers, and the state, because there's already Housing First money contracted in the community with providers um, on the state side. But that's for services only. So we're going to partner with them and use our um, match vouchers with those services in order to be able to implement on a faster track. So that's how we're doing it. And our, as you know, our department's um, rent to work program that works out of Work Hawaii Division currently provides those kind of tenant based rental assistance. So we have the infrastructure in the department to work with the landlords directly. So we're going to partner that with the money that's already out there in order to get ahead of the time frame for the RFP. And in terms of efforts to um, implement the same type of expedited effort. Um, this is a little bit premature, but there's we have been approached by one of the providers that works in the Chinatown area. I think you may be familiar with that. We're not here to disclose it. We've still got some work to do with the community in terms of announcing it, but yes, we are working with the providers in Chinatown to be able to expedite our efforts on Housing First in that neighborhood as well. I think the, the designation of the Housing First model, you know, is um, hard to um, uh, reconcile with, you know, some of the housing choices that are available in Chinatown. And so that was one of the reasons that we added funding, you know, to expand upon existing types of programs, mm -hmm. because we know that for the most part, many of the um, individuals that we have in, in Chinatown that businesses are very concerned about do have other issues and problems that we know will require a certain level of 24-7 uh, medical and other kinds of assistance. And, you know, we have been um, very um, pleased by the city's uh, HPD, you know, joint efforts along with um, Department of Human Services and Department of Health mm -hmm. in looking to see how we can go forward with community-assisted treatment placements. Mm -hmm. So we have been um, working on this for the last uh, almost 18 months, ever since Act 221 2013 was adopted, and we hope that uh, the city will step up to the plate, you know, on some of those types of placements and expedited alternatives because we know that the um, housing first model that is sort of the, you know, the more traditional housing first types of scattered site placement may not be the answer um, that, you know, we will be able to use in our area where we have a very specialized type of population. And we recognize that, and I think as Mr. Yang said earlier, Housing First is a philosophy, and you've really got to look at each person and, and their story and their case and their needs to identify the best solution. Um, and so we, we're aware of, I apologize, I couldn't make Monday's meeting. I know you folks met on Act 221, and we have been talking to the providers who specialize in working with the mental health patients and being able to implement those efforts. 
Okay, well, okay. if we can keep to the same timetable, August is, uh, you know, I think something that we are striving for, and I think if we can show that um, we can be successful in housing people, then communities will begin to trust that, you know, we can get our arms around this problem and, and actually implement some safe and um, meaningful solutions. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Director Woody Oakland, wouldn't you agree that the legislation being proposed this morning before the committee, uh, especially the $32 million appropriation uh, that the council uh, bumped up to help with affordable housing uh, and homelessness is a combination of compassion and compassionate disruption that the mayor talks about. Absolutely. The mayor has always um, presented the homelessness issue as a multifaceted problem that we needed to approach in very different directions. And so this legislation is very, one piece of a very comprehensive effort that this, this administration is putting forward. So you would agree that this is not a single-pronged approach by the council or by the administration. We are actually appropriating money to help to assist with providing the less fortunate with a place to go, and at the same time providing additional encouragement for those who need a little encouragement to utilize those services and accept those services that are offered. That's correct, and, and we've listened to the providers, the folks who have been doing this services in the community for many years, and they encouraged us to provide that extra nudge, as you say, to um, help them make a decision that it's time that they really make that choice to seek either shelter or permanent housing, permanent supportive housing. And there are some who need that additional encouragement, correct? Absolutely. You know, the statistics show us that the chronically homeless, most of which are men severely mentally ill, um, 50 years ago, they would have been in a different type of setting, and I think we need to provide alternatives to them besides being homeless. And we certainly don't want to go back to th those former settings of, of decades ago, but uh, we would like to encourage folks to accept the services that are offered, and with the monies that are being appropriated, uh, that have been already appropriated by this council, and uh, that the administration now has available, you're working towards that end, correct? That is correct. Members, any further questions for the administration at this point? Vice Chair? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So, uh, Director, now that you're here, I won't rehash all my earlier questions, but um, I think you can address this question um, better. So, earlier we talked about having bed space available in homeless um, shelters. Mm -hmm. um, Director Yang talked about um, perhaps only certain population of the homeless are appropriate for the, ho the housing first initiative. So um, if, we, if we look at doing this, um, this bill, limiting it just to Waikiki as the mayor proposes, how many homeless do we have in Waikiki? And the follow-on question is, so how many of those, <coughs> I, I know you can't say for sure, but if we can take a guess, how many of those would be appropriate for homeless shelters versus housing first. Okay. We've always focused our efforts on the chronically homeless population. Okay, That's the 558 that are chronically homeless on the street for over a year, severely mentally ill, and substance abusers. So if we look at that, you asked the first question, is how many are in Waikiki? Yes. The numbers break down where 40% are in Chinatown, downtown Chinatown, 30% are in Waikiki, and another 30% are out in the Leeward Coast. Most of those are families on the leeward side. The ones in downtown are mostly individuals. So 30% of the 558, that's about 150, 175 individuals. If they are truly chronically homeless and severely mentally ill, they're probably not good candidates for the shelters. And we have some shelter providers here who can attest to that better than I can. Um, those are the ones who are most likely, based on the evidence-based program of Housing First, most likely to succeed in a permanent supportive housing setting. So those are the, the numbers. Okay, so my follow-on question is then, by the way, I still believe August is not doable, but uh, let's say it is. Um, would you be ready with enough Housing First units in August when we, get, when we start your, your efforts. And again, you know, part of my, my compromise I was going to suggest is, is actually implementing this, this law mm -hmm. only when we have 
the support system in place. So on August 1st or whenever it is, how many people can you accommodate in Housing First? I don't have the data geographically in front of me, but we have reached out to all of the developers who build affordable housing. And so you, you folks are familiar with Gary Furuta, Hawaii Housing Development Corp, Marvin Hawaii, of PHAC, um, those types of organizations. I think Kevin Carney was here yesterday from EAH. We've contacted all of those folks who manage, have devel developed and manage an inventory of affordable housing. It, all of them who have capacity are very willing to accept Housing First um, clients or residents. Um, they ha some have some of their properties have waiting lists, so they're unable to help. Obviously, putting a Housing First candidate on a waiting list is not consistent with what our goals are. But to the extent they have capacity, I can get you some more information uh, very shortly and geographically where we have already identified capacity. But we started that months ago in identifying which neighborhoods and which developers and which buildings have capacity uh, within the existing affordable housing inventory. Okay, I would appreciate that okay. data. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Vice Chair. Members, any further questions for these members of the administration? Okay, thank you. Would the Director of the Department of Planning and Permitting please come forward? George Arthur, Director of Planning and Permitting. Thank you, Director, for being here. Uh, Director, I placed Resolution 14-117, proposing land use ordinance amendments related to the Waikiki Special District on the agenda so that we could discuss the Waikiki Special District and how it may relate to some of the bills that are being considered before the committee. Uh, is it your opinion as the Director of the Department of Planning and Permitting that the Waikiki Special District, uh, the Waikiki Special Design District section of the Land Use Ordinance Amendment would need to be re-examined? Um, uh, I think my, my position would be that the uh, Special Design District is not the vehicle for the, uh, to try to marry this kind of legislation. Uh, th these bills uh, uh, from 42 on are more social, behavioral, management kinds of uh, bills and the design district is, is not designed and doesn't have the kind of tools and framework uh, to uh, enforce this kind of kind of thing so yeah if, if the, the, these bills were passed I think th they wouldn't belong in the LUO and, and the WSDD they would be in some different section of ROH so I think it would be difficult for our staff to to try to merge the two, th two th together are there any areas of the special district that you foresee may need amendment if any of these measures do pass? I don't think so. I don't. Th yeah, because although it's, they, they talk, uh, these bills talk about sidewalks, uh, public public sidewalks, we just have design guidelines for the sidewalk. N nothing about enforcement of behavior on the sidewalk. So you don't believe that we would need to uh, consider any possible amendments to the special design district if, in fact, any of these bills pass? No. I don't think so. Thank you, director. Members, any questions for the Department of Planning and Permitting? Okay. Thank you, Director. Okay, if there are no more questions for the administration, we'll move to public testimony. First uh, registered testifier, Sarah Leone, followed by Tom Berg, followed by Rick Egid. And for those who have not registered to testify, when we reach the end of our registered testifiers list, uh, I will call for additional testifiers and we will be permitting those who want to speak whom we have not signed up the opportunity to speak. Sarah Leone, Tom Berg, if not, Mr. Egid. Mr. Egid will be followed by Sherry Menor McNamara. Good morning, Chair Anderson. Good morning. Members of the committee, Vice Chair Harimoto. Uh, my name is Rick Agat. I'm the chairman. I mean, the chairman. You're the chairman. I am the, <laughs> the president of the Waikiki <laughs> Improvement Association. Um, and I want to express my appreciation both to the administration and, of course, to the council. And it's been said several times already this morning that um, everybody understands the situation in Waikiki, um, that it's uh, basically moving to kind of a crisis situation and uh, 
that it is affecting our visitor industry numbers and therefore it's it's imperative that more be done these two bills and and I and I must say that the administration uh, they may have had other sources but we specifically asked them to consider these two areas um, because we looked at and we, we actually didn't talk uh, directly to the Seattle, but we did talk to San Francisco. There's a business improvement district in San Francisco that uh, says that the sit lie law has been very effective in being able to keep the sidewalks clear for the for pedestrians and people who are who are trying to get from one place to another in, in San Francisco. And, and that really comes down to it. That this is what what we're looking towards is to make sure that the sidewalks are used for the the purpose that they were put in place for. Um, and I know, you know, I don't, I don't want to pretend to say, oh, this is, you know, not um, aimed at the homeless because uh, obviously the homeless are a big part of this issue, but it's, actually they are not the entire part. I'm not even sure that some of the worst offenders that we have in terms of sitting on the sidewalks in Waikiki and harassing visitors are homeless. I don't know that they are homeless. And so, uh, you know, it is an issue that we, we believe that um, we need more tools in order to be able to, to deal with. Uh, and so this sit-lie law, it, it's not the, the answer, the silver bullet that's going to solve all our problems, uh, but it does give us a tool to be able to ensure that the, this very important business district is, is kept open for business and that our visitors and our residents, I mean, we hear these complaints at the neighborhood board all the time. I go to almost all the neighborhood board meetings in Waikiki. It's not just the visitors, it's, it's our residents and local people as well. We can't allow a, a climate of, of fear and unsanitary conditions to mar uh, this very important business district of Honolulu. And so we'd urge your support. You have my written testimony for Bills 42 and 43. Thank you very much. Mr. Egan, would you agree that if just the Waikiki ordinances are enacted that we could end up inadvertently moving people to other parts of the island? Well, and thus simply shifting the burden from one part of the island to somewhere else. It, in to a degree, but some of the some of the, the areas where this I think would be most effective for us, uh, they're coming to Waikiki not because they need a place to sit down and lie down, but because that's where the money is. You know, they're begging for their panhandling, aggressive panhandling. Uh, they're um, looking for uh, food in the trash cans. And, you know, there's, I mean, there's a lot of different things you can do. This is not, again, it's not the total answer. Uh, locked trash cans is a, is a potential answer that we're looking at. Uh, but I think that, yes, if you're looking at, the, that, at homeless individuals, when you press a homeless individual that's on a sidewalk in Waikiki, he's not going to stop being homeless by getting forcing him out of Waikiki. He's going to go somewhere else, you know. And uh, I think that it, the city has found, I mean, in the state, whenever we work in a particular area, it pushes the problem from one site to another. So uh, to say, if we put pressure on it in one place, is it going to? Are the homeless going to go somewhere else? Yes, of course they are, you know. And uh, I think we'd be silly or lying to ourselves if we said that they wouldn't. And so uh, we have to look at um, this as, and I, and I agree very much with uh, um, the idea that this has to be only part of a whole effort that we make for unhomeless. And even this, these two bills are only a part of that whole effort of, of um, as I've heard the state homeless coordinator call it compassionate disruption. But when you talk to the homeless providers, and we actually just had a forum in Waikiki on Tuesday, where we asked the Waikiki Health Center, IHS, and actually the Queens um, Medical Center, which is is uh, made affected in a major way by the homeless, uh, to come and talk to us about their services and what was going on, they all told us we have to keep the pressure up on on homeless to seek the help and to seek programs because if we don't, what we've created is a way too attractive environment. I mean, the things that make Waikiki such a great visitor destination or Hawaii such a great visitor destination obviously makes it friendly to someone who wants to just live, live on the street or live on the, on, the, uh, on the land, if you will. And so uh, we have to be able to um, encourage in a very strong way uh, 
those individuals to seek the programs that are available. It's our responsibility, I think, as a community. This is not a tourism issue. This is a community issue. Does it affect tourism? Yes. It affects all our communities. I listened to Councilmember Menor talk about the problem in his community. So it's all, all around the, uh, the island. So as a society, we have to deal with it. And I, have to, and, I, and I would say very strongly to the question that was asked earlier, visitor industry is willing to step up and do its part. We've been working with the administration in a number of different ways. And, uh, but it is a community issue not a tourism issue, not just a Waikiki issue. And so there needs to be a whole comprehensive plan for taking care of the homeless, and the, and the homeless are not, a, homeless are not a, a monolithic group, obviously. There's all these different problems. There's as many problems as there are homeless. Each one has their own individual issues. And um, so we need to work at, on all those fronts to make progress and to, to address this issue as a community. I introduced Bills 45 and 46, Mr. Egid, because of the concern that's been shared with council members that enacting this simply in Waikiki is going to result in the unintended consequences of folks moving from Waikiki to other areas. And I think it's obvious that council members have in fact been contacted by their constituents because council member Fukunaga introduced the bill because she was contacted by her constituents. I personally have been contacted by people from Mo'ili'ili to Kaneohe. Folks in Kailua wanted a specific Kailua ordinance. Folks in Kaneohe wanted a specific Kaneohe ordinance. Folks in Vaimanalo wanted a specific Vaimanalo ordinance. Is this the way, though, that we deal with this particular issue? I think not. I think from a policy standpoint that the best way to, to deal with these issues is on a comprehensive island-wide approach. And that's why I introduced both Bills 45 and 46. So then ra rather than dealing with it community by community by community, with the exception to Waikiki, that that would be the best way to do it. My comment to that would be that uh, we certainly have looked, and the administration has looked very closely from a legal point of view, uh, how these particular bills can be enacted and be in effect in Waikiki. And in fact, I think ur urination and defecation is actually already in, Chinatown, in the Chinatown area. Uh, and, I, and I would support that we move Bills 42 and 43 forward for that reason. Uh, what can, we be, can be done on an island-wide basis to address this issue, I think is, is just referencing what I said a few minutes ago, uh, is very important to do. Uh, I think that that may end up being uh, somewhat modified from what you would do in a very intense commercial area like Waikiki. So yes, I think you do have to look at how homelessness affects the whole community. I, I live in Kaka'ako. My kids are afraid to go to the park to play basketball. You know, I mean, it's, we do, but I go with them. You know, they can't, I don't send them out alone to go play basketball at the park. And so I, I can understand the, the issue uh, is, is not just in Waikiki, and, and again, that's what I just said. So I would certainly support looking at what can be done island-wide, but I would uh, ask the council to certainly not delay moving forward on the uh, issue in Waikiki uh, while that takes place. If they can be done in tandem, fine, but I think that you probably have different issues uh, if you start talking about using these particular tools island-wide, and you have to look at what, what issues or what, what consequences come from applying something that was kind of um, <clears throat> designed to affect a very small commercial area uh, to an, an island-wide environment. What, is it, what other issues come up and what things do you have to deal with? So uh, yes, I think they, they should be discussed, but I don't think that uh, should be cause to delay taking action in Waikiki. Thank you. Members, any questions for Mr. Egan? Vice Chair Harimoto? <coughs> So, Mr. Egget, I think we all, all, everyone understands the urgency of the problem, especially in Waikiki. That's a given. We all know that. Um, but the concern is real that we're just moving the homeless around to different areas. So, with that in mind, um, as I was asking the administration earlier, you know, we need some assurance that the support system will be in place to give the homeless the support they need so that they don't just move to different areas. So then my question to the administration was, 
what is the commitment from the Waikiki community and the businesses. Um, sitting around a table saying, you know, let's work together is one thing, but having real commitment in terms of partnership, I mean, true partnership, including resources or commitments, is entirely another. So, you know, I'm willing to compromise on this um, if need be, mm -hmm. but only if we can get assurance of that real, true commitment from the Waikiki community and businesses that they will partner with us. So it's not just sitting around a table saying, okay, we want to do this, city, take care of it. I understand. And be before I answer that part, that very important part of the question, let, let me just address the first part of what you said first. And that is that make sure that there are the support systems in place before you take more action. Uh, I would say that there are substantial support systems that are already in place. I know Connie Mitchell is here to testify today too. She was one of our speakers at that forum that we had on Tuesday. And, and uh, if you, you listen to the, the programs that are available, in fact, she was just telling me that, that they have already moved 50 homeless people from Waikiki into permanent housing. So there are systems in place. She, she told me she has uh, upwards of 60 beds on a nightly basis available for single males. There are, there is uh, space available, but if we make it too easy for people to stay on the street, then they don't sleep in those beds, they, they sleep in Waikiki, you know. And so I think it's important that we not delay these kinds of very important tools to put in place to allow us to keep our public spaces open to the public because there are systems in place I mean, this is not a brand new problem. We all know that. And so uh, do we need more? Do we need housing? The permanent housing is really the end problem. And that's what we need more of. And obviously, I, I really applaud uh, this council, the administration, the state legislature, the governor. I think there is that recognition by our policymakers, by our elected officials, and you are moving resources in that direction. But of course, that takes some time put in place. But nevertheless, we do have facilities available that are not being fully utilized. And so we think, we think that we need to increase that pressure to make it uncomfortable to be, to um, live outside, to be a street person uh, in order to get more participation in that uh, system that we do have in place and we, as we all want more housing uh, to be available to them. To your Second question, which is uh, very uh, specific to the visitor industry and what have we done. Um, I know that I'm not going to uh, talk about his program, but George Segetti is here and he can talk to some of the things that have been done with uh, the money that is available from a, on a charitable basis from the visitor industry. Uh, for as In specific, in terms of our discussions with the mayor, uh, we have offered to uh, provide resources to help keep the restrooms open so that, you know, we're talking about public urination and defecation. Thank you. There needs to be a restroom open 24 hours, so we have told the city that we're willing to put up resources to do that. Um, the uh, One of the things, the commitments that we made early on, and we've discussed this at my board level uh, several times, and believe me, this is, um, it's as you can imagine, it's not even an easy pill to swallow there, is that we have to house homeless in Waikiki. Uh, we, we, WIA is willing to say right now we will support housing for homeless individuals in Waikiki. You know, we're not saying they have to be moved out to another neighborhood. Uh, we think all the communities should be willing to do that because, again, this is not just a Waikiki issue. That was very obvious from the discussion here today. So all the communities should be willing to do their part, but Waikiki is willing to do its part. And, and the other point that I would of course make is, uh, although I'm sure you've heard this many times, is that Waikiki, because that's where the money is, I mean, we generate 20%, almost 20% of the total tax dollars collected by the city and county of Honolulu. When you count property tax, commercial property tax, and the, T, the share of the TAT that the city gets. So we would venture to say that we've always been willing to do our share. We're always doing our share. And, but does that mean that we can't do more? No, we can do more and we'll look for ways to do more and to help the, work with the city and work with the community on being able to take care of this very uh, important issue. Thank you for that. I do appreciate the commitment. And um, I, 
I think before we, we move this forward, though, I, I would like to have a more firm commitment from all the resources in Waikiki. So I just want to lay that on the table. Perhaps the discussions can continue. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Thank you very much, Mr. Egan. Sherry Menor McNamara. Oh, Mr. Egan. I'm sorry, could you? Oh, Sherry, you can sit. You can have a seat. It's okay. Mr. Egan, if you could uh, please remain. Council Member Kobayashi has a question. It was good yes. to hear that um, y your commitment that Waikiki would help in providing housing because the, the way to solve this is to provide housing. So, um, you know, I trust your leadership because you've always delivered when we've asked about trash, you know, all the different um, improvements to Waikiki. So, um, and I've, I, I spoke with Governor Abercrombie about having a, a plan with the state, city, private, um, where we can move on this. And as New York City did, they started in Times Square, and that's how they started to solve their problem. So, uh, you know, I agree with you that may, we should start in Waikiki. And yes, the homeless may move. Um, they, they should. Where else can they go? But at the same time that we start this Waikiki um, effort, we should also, if you could help us find um, old apartment buildings that we could renovate, We've, as um, uh, Georgette Demer mentioned, working with people like uh, the George Furuta, others I've talked with, Colin Kippen. Um, if we could, if you could help us find um, housing, say on Pau Kalani or wherever there are available buildings, and we, as we start in Waikiki to solve this problem, we can also at the same time, with the monies appropriated, start working on providing permanent housing. Um, you know, low-income rentals, et cetera. So, you know, if we could do that, that would be a good place to start is in Waikiki. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, so you will help us find buildings. <laughs> <in> <laughs> well, <laughs> certainly we're willing, we're willing to help. In fact, I, in, in one We've of the earlier discussions, realtors, we, we yeah. gave a whole list of, of uh, buildings that were available oh, uh, to, the, to the city at one point. Uh, but frankly, we, we got that list by just going through the real estate mm -hmm. listings. You know, it's this is not this is this is not uh, magic, right? You know, but, but we it, have and, and, yeah. and, and what I think is 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 true is that the the city's um, uh, I think they were constrained up to this point because up until now, where we have money right around mm -hmm. the corner, I guess it's fo the, mo the monies you guys were discussing, you folks were discussing was uh, available in July. Uh, they're actively, I know that the city uh, uh, officials and responsible are actively looking for exactly what mm -hmm. we just discussed, buildings and rentals. As we speak, they're looking for them. And so, uh, and c any, in any way that we can, we can help, we're happy to help. But I, I think that that part of it is, is uh, is actively going on it's the issue bec then becomes once you've exhausted those where do you go then and and i think we do need to look to some of the developers who've been successful in this area uh, i think there is I, and, and as i said I've, I've already been approached by one developer i, I don't want to go into detail mm -hmm. but asked about and they own the property in waikiki already and uh, I, and I said I would support, and the, what WI would support the development of housing for the homeless, and very similar to this housing housing first program, if not directly a part of the housing first program. So uh, I think that one of the the key components is uh, uh, you have to have a willingness in the in the mm -hmm. community to embrace these efforts and to support them, and rather than making them more difficult, as has happened in other right. situations. I was just going to say that it's very hard to cite. Uh, some, especially housing. First, I worked with uh, Councilmember Fukunaga in trying to, you know, help in Chinatown. But uh, you know, it's very hard to cite like a um, housing first building um, if it's not wanted in a community. So, if you could help us with that too. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And I see Max Sword, and I understand he is already committed to <laughs> providing some units. So thank you. I'm, thank not, you I'm not aware of Max's commitment. So. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Chair.
It's okay, we're aware of it, Mr. Egan. <laughs> Aloha and good morning, Aloha. Sherry good morning. Menor McNamara with the Chamber of Commerce of Hawaii. Uh, you have our testimony, so I'll just summarize our testimony. Uh, the Chamber is the largest business organization in the state with uh, more than a thousand members. Uh, the Chamber supports Honolulu City Council Bill 42, uh, as well as we support 43. Uh, we support the intent of applying this legislation to the Chinatown area, as well as island-wide. Um, Homelessness impact is felt not only by the tourism sector, but all sectors, and it's a social issue that we all need to work collaboratively and address. Uh, we're hearing more and more from our members, residents, and even visitors about the impact of it. Um, visitors saying that you know they've been coming to Hawaii for a number of years, but because of the homelessness problem, uh, they no longer want to come and visit. And so it's a real issue that we need to address immediately. Uh, because it will have an impact on our economic climate as well as overall uh, the quality of life for our state, for the people of our state. Uh, while we understand the difficulty in coming up with solutions, we feel that these two bills are the right, uh, are taking the right step in the, um, taking steps in the right direction. So we fully support these two bills and ask that the council pass the measures. Thanks. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. Minor McNamara? Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you. Um, thank you. But um, I guess, the, would you agree, though, that the goal is not to just move the homeless out of Waikiki? Is that correct? You would agree with that? Yes. So you would agree that the goal is to get them to the point where they can live appropriately in housing? Right. And so we hope that these bills at least will help or incentivize or encourage the homeless people to seek shelter. Um, whether it's at IHS or through the Housing First or other programs that are available. Well, I guess that's... So it's not the complete solution, but at least we hope that right. that, that, that will encourage. But that, that concerns me. You know, just because we make a law to make something illegal doesn't mean they're going to get help and, and support. We have to provide the adequate help and support. Mm -hmm. So um, that concerns me if people are thinking, we'll just pass these laws and they'll go and get help. So in terms of my question earlier, though, you know, what commitment can we get from the businesses, from the business community to partner with the city to make sure that we have the support system in place, including services as well as housing? Because the last thing we want to do is pass a law that just moves them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So can we get some kind of commitment from the business community? As Mr. Egan mentioned earlier, the business community is already committing dollars and resources to charities or even through our Chamber's Public Health Fund. We've provided dollars to homelessness programs. Um, but right, it's something that we need to be part of uh, and collaborate with the city as well as other stakeholders in coming up with effective solutions so that uh, the, we can improve the situation. Thank you. Additionally, there are many businesses that, f for whatever reason, and it is their right, uh, who do not make their restroom facilities uh, available for public use. Is that something that you could possibly talk to your members about? Well, that's something we can go back to our membership and get a feel of what and they... Again, we fully understand that it is each individual business's right to open mm -hmm. or not open their facilities for public use. But if that is something that your members could consider for uh, public service, and public benefit, uh, I, I think that would go a long way into providing some assistance. And perhaps if we could work with the Waikiki business community uh, to see if uh, we could also assist those of your members who are willing to do that mm -hmm. with services for cleaning and supplies and such. That's a discussion we can have. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Connie Mitchell. Aloha kako. Thank you very much for the opportunity to testify. Um, I just want to um, very make it very clear that I am in support of both 42 and 43. Um, I wanted to provide some context. And everybody's been asking, well, is this really, you know, like the answer? We all know it's not the answer. But I also want to say that um, as much as we think homelessness is a problem, we have gotten 50 calls in the last 60, six months calling to come to Hawaii. And these are people who are homeless, 
and they're going to come if we don't discourage them. And so for me, my sense is that um, we need to create a community where we really have expectations of people that come here, that it isn't about them just wanting to come and be homeless in Hawaii, because that is just absolutely not okay with me either, and I'm a homeless service provider, because it seems like no matter how many people we're able to house and we, you know, serve, we keep getting more. And so I think that these two bills, you know, um, will at least let people know it's not okay, you know, to just come and decide that you're going to live on the sidewalk, because that is what it sometimes amounts to, or very often it amounts to. Also, I just want to say that in Waikiki, the new homeless that um, people encounter, the homeless service providers encounter um, number, I mean, the, the folks that are being encountered are about 70% not from Hawaii. Every community has a different gra um, demographic in terms of your homeless. And we have to have different answers. And so, you know, I do support um, 42 and 43 for this particular reason. And I had my testimony written up, but I just really wanted to at least share that part because I really do feel like um, I wanted you guys to know. Also, I just want to, if you give me just a few more seconds, there are a lot of other initiatives that are going on that are providing a lot of services for folks. You asked about housing. Um, the state just awarded um, a one point, well, a hundred, well, let's see, one million dollar grant for housing first, not to us, but to U.S. vets and um, to Waikiki Health Center and Kali Palama to do housing, you know, for, and this is really to put people into the housing. Um, IHS just received a federal grant um, that will be probably put into play in the fall that will allow us to house um, probably 33 more people in permanent supportive housing. The city is kind of, um, has awarded us another grant to do transitional, um, sober transitions for people who have substance abuse. There are a lot of services being offered up for housing and for, not enough, not enough, I just want to say, but a lot of services that are offered to people. But if people don't want it, we really have to have expectations of people. So I just ask you to consider that when you consider these two bills. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions for Ms. Mitchell? Okay. That's the end of our registered testifiers list. Is there anyone else here with us who would like to testify? Please come forward. My name is Catherine Gian with the Pacific Alliance to Stop Slavery. I did register um, online. I'd like to clarify some misconceptions that the business community may have about these criminalization policies. First of all, California statewide has not implemented a sit and lie law, just the city of San Francisco. Berkeley considered it, and they launched a study out of the University of California, Berkeley, which found that there is no meaningful evidence to support arguments that sit and lie laws increase economic activity. And they certainly do not help homelessness, as we found in San Francisco. And your question earlier about Seattle, how effective their sit and lie law was, well, I brought up in my uh, previous testimony that their law was different because it applied to muggings, preventing muggings and assaults in an abandoned area. Yes, it was a commercial area, but it was an abandoned commercial area. Okay. When, to answer your question, Council Member Harimoto, there was no effect that that sit and lie ordinance had on homelessness in those areas. In fact, or on the homelessness, in fact, and this is researchable, in fact, it was only improved, the homeless situation, when the city implemented Housing First programs. Now, if we're going to model our uh, laws after Seattle, let's model after all of what Seattle has done. They have implemented tent cities. They have increased their budgets for housing, low-income housing, as well as increased their minimum wage to a livable wage. Um, there's a lot of disinformation going on, but let's not create the same mistakes that other cities have made before us. That would just be a waste of time and a waste of money. And I work in criminal law, criminal system, and the juvenile justice system. And I have to say that you do not want to create more criminal laws that put nonviolent, peaceful people who are extremely poor and have no resources into prison. Not only does it clog up our already overburdened pr prison and court system, it is unethical and traumatic. And it also has proven in tests and studies that it 
actually deepens and worsens the time that person spends as a homeless person. Because why? Even a petty misdemeanor can prevent somebody from obtaining a loan, if even especially a student loan, if they want to go back to school, getting a job, and also the societal uh, stigma of being having a criminal record. Okay, So if you want to help the homeless, this is not part of a comprehensive plan. You have models for comprehensive plans that have been proven to work. Criminalizing the homeless is not part of a comprehensive plan. It is unconstitutional. It d divides our community between classes of rich and poor. Back in the old days, Waikiki, so, some people, some business people tried to establish Waikiki as a whites only area, okay? I don't know if you remember that in our history books. Let's not do the same thing with regard to the poor. Let's use these comprehensive plans that other cities have established before us and implement them and fully fund the operating costs for Housing First. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Members, any questions? Uh, Brett Pruitt. Is there anyone else here who has not testified who would like to do so, if you could? Our committee aide will go around the room with, regi uh, with registration forms. If you could just please take one and sign one so that we can call you up, uh, that would be much appreciated. Please proceed. Good morning, Council Members uh, and Council Chair. If you could please state your name for the record. My name is Brett Pruitt, and, I'm, and just to tell you what brought me here this morning, to just give my perspective. I'm a business owner, and my business is on the corner of Hotel and New Wanu Streets in Chinatown. And I have a, a working relationship with my chronically homeless gentlemen that sleep under the eave of the building that I rent in every day. And we have a deal during business hours. They move to the park. And they're not bad guys. They're, you know, they're mentally ill. And they and really, it breaks my heart to work with these guys. But the bill before us today is about Waikiki, and I have no skin in the game at all about Waikiki, other than the fact that it affects all of us in our economy. And I know that if we use law enforcement techniques like um, Councilman Kobayashi brought up about New York, and they use their disorderly conduct laws to make Manhattan uh, usable for visitors, if this is just a tool, this is no cure to homelessness. It is a tool that needs to be implemented with the police, and we need to make sure that we support the police in their efforts in trying to create a different environment. Our friend from IHS would, couldn't be more true in my personal experience that we need to create an incentive for services. Because my guys in the park next to my building, which I've known for years now, get offered services weekly. There's, there's medical services that come that do physicals right there in the park. These folks are not lacking services. They're just lacking a place to go. I, I talked to the police. We're having, gentleman's having a full-on psychotic episode right in front of the police, and I asked the police, so where do we go from here? And they say, well, we can't do anything until something happens. And I go, well, that moment could happen at any time. So we, we have a big issue in front of us, and all I'm asking is that you guys support the tools required to make a, create an environment in Waikiki that isn't um, conducive to panhandling and sleeping on the park and wrecking the golden goose. Thank you very much, Mr. Pruitt. Thank Members, you. any questions? Council Member Fukunaga. I do have one, um, one point for Mr. Pruitt. You know, we have been, the area legislators have been working with businesses in your neighborhood uh, to implement the assisted treatment model, uh, which would allow us to direct people who do have um, mental health challenges into appropriate placement and treatment. So it's, it's a slightly different model. It's really community-assisted commitment of a sort so that they would not be on the street but the goal is to have them redirected into uh, programs where appropriate services can be provided to help them get beyond where they are 
Well, I'm going to say something very politically incorrect here, but in my personal experience, in my personal relationships with my homeless friends, is some of them will never be in that program. They just will not participate, service, regardless of the amount of services you provide. The question is, what do we do with these folks? You know, a friend of mine from IHS once said, you know, the homeless are not monolithic, as we all know, and the have-nots, the will-nots, and the can-nots. The problem is, is we have no place for the can-nots. So the housing first thing is fabulous, but we need to, our, our mentally ill, homeless, the ones that make us all uncomfortable, that urinate and defecate right in their clothes, and we have to walk by every day. We treat our pets better. So we should make a really, first, Waikiki, second, let's try to figure out what we're going to do for these folks. That would be my suggestion, and good luck, a big gig. Okay, well, you know, this, this law did go into effect in 2013. It is a program that calls for communities to assist in committing individuals who are really um, becoming harmful both to the community as well as to themselves. And um, there are a number of individuals who have been identified, you know, that we think would benefit from such a program. So you're saying there's a program that, that the court I'm happy to provide you with That's additional great. information. That's great. We need we more have, implementation for our friends. We have been working uh, with a number of agencies for at least a year to get a lot of the um, procedural steps in place. Well, that's fabulous. All right. Well, thank you for the hard work and enduring that morning meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Barbara Hudman. Sorry, Ron. Um, after Ms. Hudman, uh, members, we can we, we can take a, sh uh, a short recess so members can stretch their legs. Okay. okay. Sorry. In order to comply with the Sunshine Law, we need to have a quorum of members present. Ms. Hudman, please proceed. Listen, well, do you all remember when we sent the six, was it four or six black men back? That was several years ago. But, uh, of course, now it's out of control, so you can't be sending everybody back. But it is true about people uh, wanting to come here. Because even in California, they would have a sign on the freeway, going to Hawaii, you know. But meanwhile, with nature, nature all over the world, reacting in many ways and here we are on this fragile coral infrastructure <laughs> wanting to put up what 15 more towers i would say forget the towers and out in wailua wayanai farms and if you had farms and then had the people like in israel in kibbutzes where it's communal they would have to help themselves and they would learn to have responsibility instead of just, you know, I mean, right now, uh, I know that the mentally ill have to be taken care of in a different way. But if you made them go into a place and say, here, because if you had the seed and I had the land and we didn't support each other, we'd both pass away. So this is what I, I think would make them uh, have responsibility and respect for themselves is to take that land instead of concrete towers and which you know we really don't need we need to take care of our people thank you members any questions Michael Daly followed by D'Angelo McIntyre followed by Jack James Thank you, Chair. Okay. Uh, so I'm Michael Daly. I'm an artist. I um, understand free speech. It's what um, I rely on in my work. Um, I am a sidewalk artist on Waikiki. I worked there last night. I'm going to be working there tonight. It's 
the way I make my income. And there's language in the bill that makes me concerned that myself and other sidewalk artists are going to be uh, roped in under this because it talks about uh, the primary a reason for sitting on the sidewalk is to is for commercial interest, which can be interpreted as um, uh, soliciting money or peddling or even just being there to make a living without even asking for money. But um, I've been homeless in Waikiki. I'm a, I've been arrested multiple times for peddling. I have a current um, $250 fine. Uh, the next time I'm probably going to go to jail for 30 days. I'm not um, sorry. I'm unremorseful. I believe that under the United Nations I'm entitled to free speech and to have the right to set up my easel and provide enjoyment. I'm not providing I'm not doing anybody harm. I'm sitting on a seat. If I choose to lie down, I can sit down. If I'm rude or acting harmfully or obnoxiously, I'm drunk, then I'm not, the existing law already is there, right? It's called disorderly conduct. You don't need anything more than that. And it appears to me that the Waikiki Improvement Association and the Waikiki Business District Association is generally allowing the, the situation in Waikiki to deteriorate to a crisis situation that Rig Agate refers to because it suits him to have people complaining about the unsightly um, situation in Waikiki. Believe me, I am a fully supportive of beautification. I appreciate your suit, actually, Ikaika. I'm sorry I called, I called you something before. But anyway, but beautification is, is a good thing overall for tourism. However, you are going into constitutional challenge here anyway because the Rick Eggerts of the world, uh, the, the Hyatts, the Sheridans, the McDonald's, the multinational corporations in Waikiki are going to have to prove that, th that, the, that somebody lying on the sidewalk is interfering with their business. Those Japanese consumers are fighting each other to get into Foot Locker, the Apple store, Apple who don't pay their taxes. This I'm concerned about is where you're getting your revenue and your, the fact that the, the city and governments, not just the city council, but the state council and even the federal government, lacks resources because they are partnering with yeah. private enterprise. Private enterprise are not concerned with the rights of homeless, nor should they. They're responsible to their shareholders. They're, they're some of the most corrupt people on this planet, and they do wear suits. And these people, um, and there's only a handful of them, we call them the 1%, but really it's the 0.0001%, isn't it? And these are the people who are starving government of their resources so that you can't do your job, ladies and gentlemen. When, when you partner with... Am I hearing this correctly, that you're trying to ask the, 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 these business organisations, the Chamber of Commerce, to help with housing? As a homeless person, I can't even abide by the draconian house rules of Next Step or Kakoako Shelter. I have to get out of there because there's curfews and there's all sorts of rules and regulations that defy any sense of um, dignity. It, it's demoralised and you signed up for programs and you're caught in a trap there for two years actually because a lot of the agencies make money and depend on their livelihood uh, through the victimisation of uh, other people's circumstances. Mr. Daly, I have to ask you to please summarise. I, I really appreciate you listening. I, I could go through any number of points that... that um, there is, there is so much at stake here at this issue, but basically 
I would like to end by just making the point that when Queen Lilio Kalani wrote her book in 1893, she said there was no homelessness in Hawaii the day before the overthrow. Why would Le Queen Lilio Kalani in 1893 talk about homelessness? You're not going to get rid of homelessness because, it, because you're under the, a federal occupation. The governor, yourself, everybody answers to Camp David, right? Camp Smith, sorry, in, in Hickam. There's a military occupation on. As soon as you get your head around that, you realise that the oppression of a certain percentage of the population is critical to oppress an uprising. Thank you for your get testimony, out. Mr. David. That's the mess. D'Angelo McIntyre, followed by Jack James, followed by Lisa Mitchell. Hello. Hello. Um, I'm D'Angelo McIntyre. Um, I'm going to keep this short. Uh, I had a long night last night, and I'm, I'm actually pretty tired. I drove here from Eva. But um, I, I oppose these measures. Um, but my main focus that I wanted to talk about was uh, 43. You, you got to open up more bathrooms. Um, that's just the bottom line. I mean, we're talking about cause and effect. You, you, you have to make a law now saying that you can't doo-doo and pee in public. Well, there's nowhere to go sometimes. And I've even been given a ticket in Thomas Square for using a bathroom that was open. A police officer gave me a ticket in a court date for taking a piss in a toilet. These things happen. So if you can get rid of things like that, I don't think there would be uh, a need for 43 if you just let people use the bathroom. And from what I understand, because I come from Kentucky, uh, businesses that serve food are supposed to offer public restrooms. And like uh, I've never heard of a McDonald's where I couldn't go in and, and use the bathroom when I wanted to. And um, it's not just homeless people that are peeing in the bushes. I have personally gave a Russian tourist a man and his, uh, a married couple, his wife had to pee and she just could not find anywhere to go. And so like, she, I was like, use those bushes over there. And like she, he had to block her. So it's the tourists, it's, it's the locals and it's the homeless, it's the houseless people. Um, we need um, adequate restroom facilities. This no public restroom shit has to stop. It's, it's annoying, it's wearing out my bladder. I can't handle it no more. And yeah, I'm going to eventually pee in the bushes. But um, last but not least, um, houselessness in Hawaii is a symptom of the occupation of this kingdom. Um, we would not be sitting here today. You would not have your um, titles if the USS Boston did not roll up into Honolulu Harbor in 1893 and point guns at Iolani Palace. This is... This, what we're dealing with now is because the United States came here and implemented their rules and their capitalistic system because he's, Michael was right, there was no houselessness in Hawaii when Lilio was in control. That's it. I'm tired. So, I'll let you go. Members, any questions? Thank you very much. Thank you. Jack James. Followed by Lisa Mitchell, followed by Derek Warren. Councilman Anderson, my name is Jack James. I'm a resident of the Thomas Square area. Uh, I just want to, something that's been overlooked today that's just hearing the testimony. Um, from a political standpoint, I probably don't agree very much with any of you all, uh, but I got to tell you what, you're doing a great job, okay, on this issue. Uh, you really are. If you listen to the services that have come to these microphones today and said what's been offered and what's available to the people that happen to be homeless in Hawaii, there are services available. And, and I commend you for what you've done and what you're trying to do. I think it needs to be more comprehensive. There are plans that are there, but it needs to be a, a state partnership. It needs to be a partnership with you all, with homeless advocacies, with the ACLU, with uh, the business community. Everyone needs to come together and to address directly uh, uh, Councilman Harimoto's question, that people need to come with a checkbook. 
and they need to say I'm going to, and I agree with you 100%. I'm in support of 42, 43, 45, and 46. But I want you to know you're doing a very good job. You're, adre you're actually, I think your problem is you don't have a good PR team. You don't have somebody else saying what we are doing well. I live in the Thomas Square area. Uh, I came to know Councilman Anderson through the issues at Thomas Square. I went to Thomas Square daily. I crawled into those tents. I met those people. I asked them as an individual, not as an organization, what can I do for you for your health care? What can I do for you to get you housing tonight? What can I do for you to get a job? What can I do to help you? I don't represent anybody, but Jack James, I'll, I'll find somebody. And I started one at a time, one at a time, one at a time. And you know what? We got down to the group. They don't want to leave. They wanted to stay there. They had a different motive than being homeless. They were beards for homeless. They were not there. And those people, I've, I've now reached out. I've gone to Next Step, and I've worked. I, just this week, we were, a group of us were at Blaisdell Park, and we served food to the homeless with St. Timothy. Last Christmas, we did a program. I couldn't drive by Nimitz Highway Viaduct anymore. And finally, I had to stop. And I crawled underneath the viaduct, and I met those people. And I went back, like, for 10 days, and I introduced myself. And I met the Maggies, and I met the Johns, and I met the, the Chemos. And I found out that 50% of the people under those viaducts are women. When, they had to, when their period comes, they have to go into the stream behind the viaducts. They said, I said, what do you need? You know what their number one need was? Ice. Their number two need was they needed a mailbox. They needed a, an address where they could get services. Ten days after that, a group of us were able to organize. And on Christmas Eve, we fed 125 people from two or three of the premier restaurants in Honolulu. That's an individual. That's a group. Of, that's no organizations. That's people coming together that's got hearts, one heart to another. Okay? We have to implement a program that has a closed back door on it, just like the lady spoke earlier, that you don't come to Hawaii to be homeless. No more. It's hard on the tail end. But to the people, to that 4,600 people that are on our streets, to the 1,600, I mean, the 4,600 that are homeless, 3,100 are in shelters because you all and people working with you have created shelters for those 3,100 people to be there tonight. There's 1,600 people on the streets. We've addressed 588 of them today are chronic. Those people, there's 1,600 individual answers. There's not one blanket that fits them all. Okay? We can solve homelessness in Hawaii. We can get this to a point where there's not one person homeless on the street, and we can do this. And you guys are the leaders, and you're doing a dadgum good job, and I think somebody needs to stand up and say, the city and county, the council of the city and county of Honolulu, we're stepping up to the plate. We're doing our share. Come on, Colin Kippen. Come on, Governor. You all step up to the plate with us. Come on, the gentleman back here, the Chamber of Commerce. Bring your checkbooks. Come up to the table. We want advocacy people from the homeless. Come to the table. Come. Let's sit in this circle. Let's solve this problem. You guys are showing the leadership. I applaud you for that. I applaud you for that. Thank you, Mr. James. Uh, on the situation at Thomas Square, uh, since the enactment of uh, Bill 7, since Mayor Caldwell signed it, have you seen an improvement? It's been dramatic. When I, uh, over two years ago, when I started meeting the people at Thomas Square, and some of them are in this room today, D'Angelo's from Kentucky, so am I as well, and D'Angelo was there. There's several people here that were, that were there. Uh, the dr people in my neighborhood were afraid to go into Thomas Square. The Kapuna, that liked to go to Thomas Square and sit at the fountain just to enjoy the afternoon. The ambulatory that would come out of Straub Clinic and could be walking to the park, they, they were scared to go there because of the circumstance. The tents that lined both King Street and, and uh, uh, South Baratania, because of the leadership of the mayor and this council, we were able to eliminate that. Today, we can go into Thomas Square. The grass is getting cut. People are doing permits. People are coming into the square. It's going to be the, art, the art, 
uh, district to Thomas Square. It's going to be a wonderful uh, uh, community for everybody to support. But we have to get a hold of this homelessness issue, and you're all doing it. Uh, can, uh, do you have another specific question, Chairman? I just wanted to ask you, Mr. James, what your it's assessment of Thomas Square is. Absolutely. The improvement from when it, where it was when I first walked over there and got personally involved to where it is today, it's 100% an improvement, and it's because of you all and what you've done, and I applaud you for that. And keep up the valiant fight. Keep people involved. Let's get more people involved. We can solve this. We literally, folks, can do away with hom homelessness in Hawaii. I'm convinced of it. We do not have to have one person, and we can shut the door so nobody else will come in. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. James. Members, any questions for Mr. James? Thank you. Lisa Mitchell, followed by Derek Warren, followed by George Segetti. Hi, Lisa Mitchell. Um, I greatly appreciate the questions you've been asking um, and holding people accountable to, um, I believe, do what this gentleman just did, you know, become personally involved. And, yeah, it does take personal involvement um, <clears throat> on a grand scale, on a very grand scale. Um, I myself haven't been doing as much as I can. I suppose, just coming here and, um, um, you know, offering whatever I have to offer. And I'm not even quite sure what that is anymore, excepting people like Michael Daly here who have given some ex incredible, excellent testimony. I used to be involved with a lot of environmental stuff a while back. And we gave a lot of testimony back then about how we had to diversify the economy and we shouldn't be so dependent on our tourism and uh, Department of Defense economy. And since that time, 20 years or less ago, seeing how nobody, I don't want to say, well, nobody, I mean, the leadership didn't listen. And I feel like... Today, you know, you guys have given me a little bit of hope um, hearing the questions and concerns, even if I will still say no to the way this policy uh, has been written because it gives a very negative um, perspective, a very negative feel for if you're really saying you want to help. Um, but getting back to diversification again of the economy. I feel like this homeless problem is a huge symptom of that problem of never diversifying, of never giving, it's really about giving people a bigger chance to explore um, you know, business opportunities, small or big, I mean, I hear all this talk about supporting small business, supporting small business, but when it came down to it, there wasn't that, you know. I'm not really a business person, so I didn't have a lot of business people around me to ask those questions, but when I did, I found out, yeah, it's the same old story, and this is, you know, a question I asked a business person a few months ago. You know, the taxes, the taxes. And I've been going to those DOI uh, hearings um, on the, about with the Department of Interior being here for the Hawaiian um, issues. And it's, it is a very, very, very important discussion becoming involved with the federal government in housing in particular, I was at some of Susie Chun Oakland's uh, I could ask meetings. you to please summarize. In summary of that particular thing, I mean, there's so many rules and regulations from the federal government that don't take into consideration Hawaii is a unique island community, an island state. And once we can have those kinds of conversations with the federal government, from people like yourselves who actually you're planning to run for office or you're, you are running for office, 
So there are definite problems with so many of the rules and regulations that the federal government puts upon Hawaii that need to be changed, and not just in housing, um, within the Invasive Species Act. There was a meeting for that, and I was shocked to find out, well, gee, all these types of um, plants and animals are being allowed because the federal government is not recognizing Hawaii as a unique ecosystem. I mean, that's, that's on a different level, but... You know, please just, um, yeah, we have to be more conscious about lots. Thanks. Thank you. Members, any questions? If not, Derek Warren, followed by George Segetti, followed by Max Sword. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Derek Warren. Um, I am a part of the Occupy, Deoccupy Honolulu movement. Um, I want to address the inaccurate portrayal of Kanavai Mamalahoi. I do not need to be taught how to pronounce it. I know what it means. Um, I've said it enough to the HPD and they should know. Um, I want to address if it protects the state how come is it not used? How come is it ignored? Um, the story, I don't care what school you came from. I'm a Kamehameha scholar myself. Unfortunately, I did not learn it in school. I learned it from a kapuna on the street while I was defending property. It is not for the protection of war. It is for the protection from tyrants. Kamehameha Conked, two fishermen, that, that buzzer's pointless, anyway. Kamehameha Conked, two fishermen on the head while they were sleeping. I will I allow you a little bit more time. Um, because he but, thought. Excuse me. That I they will stole allow you a little him. more time, um, but in, out of respect of the other testifiers, I do need to ask you to please do your best to summarize okay. shortly. Okay, I am summarizing if you let me continue. Continue. Lay on the path, what else is that supposed to mean? You just lay and just stand, look at the sky? I don't know. Lay on the path. It means to sleep. Lisa Mann, uh, she said homelessness is a behavior. It is not a behavior. It was a, a result of misdirection of funds, of misdirection of energy. Almost done. It is counterintuitive to take the houseless and prosecute them when they have no choice. Even if they accept the resources, like myself, they are put on a wait list. Where are they supposed to go then? Last but not least, the Visitors Association helps get tourists their lost baggage, but does not help the houseless keep their humane necessities. That is hilarious. Panhandling, locked trash cans, seriously? If the tourists do so much coming into Waikiki, bringing their money. How come they can't help the direct issue that's right in front of their face? They rather walk by. They rather spend, you know, you have the right to spend your money and go party. But you're helping us supposedly help the issue right in front of your face. And you're making Thomas Square an arts district? What about the Kaka'ako arts district? You're going to put war towers there? That's for anybody who's listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? George Segetti, followed by Max Sword, followed by Dave Moskowitz. I guess I could say good afternoon, Chair Anderson, and thank you very much, Committee. Um, I'm going to, for the sake and respect of your time, I'm going to make mine very, very short. I'm going to stand on my written testimony. We are in strong support of Bill 42 and 43. But having heard the 44, 45, and 46, we're not opposed to the content of those bills. But we are strongly asking you, you support 42 and 43. Um, I have been in Waikiki two years now. I am the, the uh, I'm sorry, I should introduce, I introduce myself, George Segetti, President and CEO of Hawaii's Lodging and Tourism Association. Thank you. 
And um, uh, I've been in Waikiki two years now, so I, I'm at the street level. I walk it every single day. And what I would say to you, what I've seen is, you know, homeless is an extremely complex issue, and it really is going to take everyone's efforts. It's going to take the city, the county, the state, the nonprofits, the private sector all coming together. We've heard that before. Now it's time to, the proof's in the pudding. We all come together. What I would say is that the, the Waikiki, um, we have any given time, 219,000 visitors in Waikiki have spent $42.7 uh, million dollars a day, um, generating 4.7. So that's an, that, those are numbers I don't think we want to ignore, but uh, we are slowly losing those numbers going to competition. What I would say about the, the, the homeless in Waikiki, what I've seen about the demographics is it's a very um, uh, transient, very transient. They don't have the carts. They're very mobile. They move where they want to move. I walked it at 2 in the morning to 4 in the morning with Mike McCartney from HTA and Senator Galateria uh, a year ago, a year and a half ago. We walked it at 2 in the morning. It was really an eye-opener in that it was a very, it, you know, the families are the one thing. We want to help them. I know you all want to help them, but it's a very complex issue. But that, I don't think that's what the, the homeless that we're necessarily seeing lying in the streets of Waikiki. It's the one that says, why kid you uh, need need drugs? It's that sign. It's that one that's prevalent through there that, to me, is making it hard on the rest of them that actually need our help. So if we can, you know, we got to address those issues. So the other thing is I hear from from visitors how uh, we have the biggest kitty litter in the, in, in the world now through Waikiki. We've got to get our arms around that and tackle that problem. I've taken enough of your time. I thank you very much for allowing me to speak. I know it's a very complex complex issue. I, 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 you have a tough job. No doubt about it. Thank Follow you. Mr. Sigetti. Members, any questions for Mr. Sigetti? Yeah. Thank you. Max Sword, followed by Dave Moskowitz, followed by Lester Kodama. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Sword. Max Sword here on behalf of Outrigger Hotels. And, uh, and you're going to share with us the resources that you and Outrigger well, wish to come I, I, I was going to tell uh, uh, Councilwoman Kobayashi, I didn't get the memo about the rooms. <laughs> So maybe it got lost in cyberspace with, with my uh, registration to uh, testify. But anyway. Well, you can just uh, tell us all about it. That's all right. <laughs> well, we we're, we're been involved with, um, uh, first of all, I just want to say that, uh, you know, it's no exaggeration that uh, uh, to say that the growing number of homelessness in Waikiki is uh, one of the uh, greatest challenges in our 67 years of existence at Outrigger. And... Uh, you know, we've been working with the WIA and the Hotel Association along with the administration to uh, rectify this problem. Uh, we have also, and not only us, uh, Outrigger, but other hotels have over the years supported organizations like the Waikiki Community Center, Waikiki Health Center, to, uh, ha you know, to work with the homelessness and so forth. Uh, unfortunately, uh, there's those that uh, don't want to go or, you know, uh, or uh, uh, be put into cubby holes or whatever the case may be, uh, and they just want to be on the street. And those, those are the ones that we need to really get to and get them into some type of a program. And we've always supported, Outrigger's always supported those type of programs. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we'll, I must disagree with the young lady that came up earlier to say that, uh, you know, about not working in Berkeley and so forth and so on. I'm not sure what her name is, but if we do nothing, you might as well kiss Waikiki goodbye. Uh, and, and I'm not exaggerating. Uh, we have to do something, both you folks and us working together along with the administration, and we're willing to do that. So, uh, as I said, we, you know, we can't ignore the problem any longer. And appreciate your time, and thank you for allowing me to testify. Mahalo. Members, any questions for Mr. Sword? Thank you very much, Mr. Sword. Dave Moskowitz, followed by Lester Kodama. Good afternoon, I think now, Chair and Council Members. I'm surprised I made it this far. Good afternoon. It's the cold going around town. You know, I, as you know, I'm in support of these bills very strongly. Um, and the gentleman before me and another one before him were talking about some particular characters we all know in Waikiki that hang out on the sidewalks. You know, I was talking to Tony Robbins, who's a friend of mine from, uh, well, some years ago I met him at a Republican convention. I'm a Democrat, but I was running the catering there. And he works with the homeless. You may have seen his reality TV show. He told me, well, he started a building about four years ago, he, uh, housing homeless people. He says the building looks 15 years old four years later, just so you know. Um, he said he thought, basically, that people are disassociated. And it's very difficult for him, and he goes one-on-one -on -one with people to get them back into 
life. And I think those are some of the big challenges you have, but I really think this bill has to be implemented. We have a tsunami of people coming here. I think I discussed this some time back about the 5 million people who are losing their unemployment benefits, and you think it's bad now. It's going to be really bad in the near future. But again, I think we have to pass this bill. I wanted to go over one thing about enforcement again. There needs to be a spe the, the mayor needs to step up with money to have a special group of HPD, and all they do is address this issue all the time is in effect, constantly, or it won't work. Okay? Thank you. Members, any questions? Lester Kodama. Followed by Liko Martin. No. Good afternoon, City Council. Good afternoon. Um, Lester Kodama, the Honolulu Star Advertiser. <clears throat> and we understand that uh, homelessness is a big problem, but um, we'd like to address and support Bill 42 and 43 as safety issues. You know, we, we distribute our products all over the whole islands, and but Waikiki is so different. You know, we encounter many of the people peddling and, you know, selling items or panhandling out in Waikiki, and I have gotten many incident reports where these people block the newspaper racks, our guys trying to distribute inside, and they become very confrontational. You know, at times they have threatened our people. At times they even, you know, our people have gotten to ver verbal confrontation with these people. And at times we even have, um, probably at night somebody urinated into our boxes and we got to send somebody out to clean these things. So we really want you guys um, to pass Bill 42 and 43 and we support it. Thank you. Thank you. Members, any questions? Thank you. Okay. Lolani, you wanted Lolani, you wanted to testify first? Or did you, or Lolani, did you and Liko want to come up together? Um, I'll, go, I'll go first and then please, Liko will join Please, if you could just please state your name for the record and offer your okay. testimony. Mahalo. Okay, my name is Lolani Teal. And um, what, I'd, what I'd like to focus on here, you know, I've, um, I've been involved with a lot of peacemaking work involving the houseless, involving um, people who work with the houseless, activism, and many other things. And um, but what, I, what I'd really like to uh, address here is the interpretation of Kanawai Mamalahoi. Um, I heard the legal opinions that were offered earlier by uh, by the Corporation Council and also by the uh, State Director on the Culture and Arts, uh, I mean, sorry, City um, Director on Culture and Arts, and I'd like to uh, point out the research of a scholar here. Uh, his name is Derek Kauanoi, and he is, um, he is at the William S. Richardson School of Law, um, and he uh, published a summary of his work. He's done quite a bit of research on Kanawai Mamalahoi as a law, and um, uh, he published on February 6, 2014, he published in the Star Advertiser um, a number of findings. Basically, he cites several actual legal applications of Kanawai Mamalahoi during the time of the kingdom when it was you know, a law that was being in effect. Um, Kamehameha invoked the law after the Battle of Pu'uko'ai on Maui, um, which freed captured warriors, and it also prevented chiefs from oppressing the people. After the Battle of Iao Valley, Kamehameha again invoked that kanavai, this time further clarifying the law's purpose in maintaining the balance between people at all levels of political and economic power. Um, he also imposed the kanavai in relationship to uh, uh, a ship, Ele the Eleanor, which carried foreign, um, you know, foreign travelers, people on it. And so uh, that clarifies the fact that it, the kanavai applies not only to native Hawaiians, but it also applies to any people within Hawaii and also to the oceans. Um, so it, this, this is a quote from him that I think is really important. Um, he says, quote, after reviewing the accounts by historians like Stephen Desha, Ab Abraham Fornander, James Jarvis, and Ralph Kuykendall, a common theme emerges, the protection of the vulnerable from those 
in more powerful or advantageous positions. Um, he also specifically says, um, Honolulu's several anti-homeless ordinances help rank our city amongst the meanest to the homeless by the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. This is precisely the type of government conduct that the law of the splintered paddle was intended to protect the people against. So this is a legal opinion from an expert in Kanavai Mamalahoi. This is not, you know, um, just a general thing, but, but this is the legal opinion of a trained legal scholar who has expertise in that area. Um, I, I would also just like to very briefly bring up another law that um, doesn't get mentioned Please do much. summarize. Yeah, okay, sure. Um, but for Oahu, because this is the Oahu, you know, this is the Honolulu City and Council, um, the Ni'au Pio Kolo Valu is a law that was in effect in Oahu. It has been in effect since the time of Chief Kuali'i who declared it. And that law is, um, it basically says that any person who encounters a hungry or a needy person, any person, must take care of that person. They must feed them. They must care for them. And I think this is just very important because, because it is a common theme in ancient law that if there is a problem in the society, the place to put the pressure is on those who have, on those who have, and then to, for them to act in aloha, which is supposed to be the way here, and never to place oppressive pressure upon those who are suffering. That is completely counter to our ali'i, to our, you know, to our values as Hawaii. So, you know, I just want, to, that's, that's basically all I want to say about that, you know, that that will help us to address the fallacy that making conditions more bu brutal and uncomfortable for people will somehow force them to get better. It won't. It's been proven over and over again. So I ask you to please do the research on that. Please, um, you know, don't be in denial. Our laws here are the basis of our law is an agreement between the people the chiefs or those who have power and the spiritual realm. And in that, the way to maintain that balance is to respect those who have the least. So mahalo, and I'd mahalo. like to call up Liko Martin at this time. Liko Martin, followed by Isaiah Chong, followed by Blade Walsh. Um, good morning, Council. Aloha. I brought my guitar because I remember one time uh, the people wanted to hear a song instead of hear more testimony, so just in case. I was born in Aiea, 1945. My family moved to the foot of Diamond Head, where I grew up, when there were only two hotels in Waikiki. When there was a seawall that ran all the way from the lighthouse all the way to in front of the Halekulani. When there was no sand there, there was fish, there was limu and everything. The only place that we had a hard time was in front of the Elks Club, where they blocked off that, that highway, so to speak. And we had to, if it was low tide, well, you could good to go. If it was high tide, well, you're going to get wet. So I grew up, uh, my grandfather sat on the first council from the time of statehood. My grandfather's Ernest Nalani Eluahin. I grew up with him. And so I spent many, today I was deja vuing many, 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 many hours of my life in this building. Um, okay, to the issue of the homelessness. Uh, in 1973, I became active with uh, evictions in Kalama Valley. As a result of that, uh, shipped out of Hon Honolulu to the Big Island, where I lived and close to the Puuhonua, Honau Nau, a Puuhonua, a city of refuge, a sanctuary that was there to protect people who were non, who, for non-combatants, for people who were sick, their families had died, diseased or otherwise, uh, were not able to care for themselves, and also for those who had reached a point in their life where material things 
and living in houses uh, was just, you know, beyond. So I grew up, uh, so in Honau now, one day one of the kupunas there, uh, two of her grandchildren were accosted in the school because they fell asleep. And the teacher said, hey, you, da 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 da, derogated them. Well, they had been fishing all night, pulling ahi out Milolii. So they, when the teacher accosted them, the kids just beat up the teacher. Because he's a 16 year old fisherman, and of course the Maka'i came and everything. When Kupuna Clara found out what happened, she could see already that the education system and all that it promised was not necessarily a secure place. You can have a house, but if it's not secure, you know? So anyway, what she did, she pulled every Hawaiian child out of Konawaina school and brought them down to an area right across from the Pu'uhunua Ohonau now. Who was, National Park was given the permission to come in there, so providing that they did not charge money to prevent our people now, who if I go there and I don't charge money, I have to go below the high water mark. I cannot use any of the facilities and anything, okay? So what happened? Here I am in my malo, in the first pilihale, which Bishop Estate said, you cannot build your pilihale. Tutu told him straight off, we'll meet you on the Kuomo'o battlefield between Honau now and Pun on that day, you come and we were prepared to fight. And that's exactly way how it came down. Families closed the road because they told Bishop Estate, no way. This is our land, we, the Pilihale went up, and then shortly after that, that incident happened. So here I am in the Pilihale. I don't know what's about to happen. The day before, all these pots, food, and everything start coming in. Early in the morning, before dark, car after car after car, bringing all, not the ones to school. You no longer needed a babysitter. You no longer needed to drop one child here, go there. And that was the living Pu'uhonua that I have seen in, my, in this modern time, okay? It was, it was about security for the families, okay? Security. You're going to be educated, but if you're not secure. So anyway, how did it work? All the families came out, the babysitters, and you're talking about the parking lot is full, just like black ants. Nobody could come. The National Park was sort of freaking out. What if they come back into the real Pu'uhonua? Okay, this is how it worked. The pool went up, the people came into the pilihale. Okay, the food that was provided was from their families who were concerned about their children. There was no grant from the county. There was no, uh, we're going to get lunches from here and there. It was about the caring for their own. So you blow the pool, you come in, you check the weather. Okay, today the water is good. Okay, what are we going to do? But the first thing was, before anybody went into that, to that hale, if there were disputes or fighting and whatnot, it was immediately ho'oponopono. That was the first order of business. It did not get to spread out in the thing. And, and so when they came out, all the men went to one side. All the females went to one side. When 500 akule came in on the boat, which, by the way, nobody else commercially could go enter and go out and fish to that, to that core. That's the family's fish. They survive on that. So all the commercial guys went back like this. So when 500 akule come, they go to the women. Two shakes, they clean. On a dry rack, whatever the family needed. The kanes, good water, you take the canoe, you go out. If it's not, boom, we're going to fix this wall, we're going to plant. And the place just bloomed. Okay. So like many things, you know, it didn't last too long. There were a lot of reasons. People got into, uh, well, we can make money off of this. and um, We'll make it easy. We go to uh, commitment school. They're going to give us lunches. And everybody started playing while making money on Hawaiian cultural, really sacred things that they were teaching. So, so update the whole thing. The Pu'uhonua, it works. Okay? I'm listening to the opinion of, uh, on the Mamalahoa. Uh, in my work, I study uh, the uh, human rights covenants, okay, and actually have letters here that went out to the governors of the seriousness of the United States' commitment 
to those human rights treaties, specifically the civil and political and racial discrimination. And in one of the sections there, it, it you know refers to not creating conditions. But, but anyway, just kind of let me try to move it forward. Right now, I'm houseless, I'm homeless, okay? Why? My grandmother's land on Kauai has a tax map key on it. And for some reason now, it's like Goldilocks and the Three Bears. There's people who have come on through various forms of legislation, who have come on to the lands because uh, maybe there were errors in the methodology of taxation, of uh, some of them challenging legally and illegally of laws of the Constitution. In other words, why am I homeless? Because I cannot go home, okay? Unless I fight with the families. So one of the processes that is going on in place on Kauai because of a tax appeal case, 0054, in which well, one I have Bay to ask you to please I will. One Bay Chang I ruled that in his final conclusions, he ruled that the Konohiki has failed to set the valuation of the land on Kauai. The Konohiki is the person and other persons who have the power that in the county charters deemed non-exclusive. The county charter does not have exclusive power. There are other people who have power on lands. Okay? Why are the people in the street? dispossessed and because the borders answer to why Queen Little Kalani at the time there is no homelessness and please let me it's because it's important things if we're you know I came down here because I read the newspaper yesterday morning well, I've got to ask okay. you please summarize I, we have another understand. committee that was supposed okay. to have started at okay. one and I still have a few the reason why there was no homelessness in 1893 is because the laws of Hawaii were very strict on idlers and they were very strict at who came into the ports and how those people affected the customary usages that the people depended upon and were tied critically to their, to their lifestyle, okay? And um, the tourist industry, they're having a grand time on our cultural places that we're driven off of. I cannot go to my family's Wailua I cannot lay my head down there with my family anymore, the police. So it's not like the tour, we're in the way of the tourism. I think the tourism has, has affected greatly and as a solution, okay, I think there needs to be more, um, just a little more conversation about it, okay? I mean, it's hard to put everything under these conditions to really talk about, and but it said we're looking for answers. That was in the newspaper, and I very much appreciate the time to share these things, and because uh, it's a huge problem. And when is it gonna? For some areas, when does it stop? It stops when you stop displacing people. Mahalo. Okay. Members, any questions? Uh, thank you. I wish I could sing a song that I wrote when I was homeless. I would. Yeah. Um, I'd, I'd love to allow okay. Uncle. The only thing is, we have another committee, and I've got to hurry. I'm, I apologize. Because I would really like to uh, continue in this, because what I experienced in Apuuhunua, the city of refuge, where when people were on the side of the street, we didn't leave them on the street, we brought them to the Apuuhunua. Fire and water. Perhaps when the, when the bills yeah. return to committee. Yeah, I would, you know, I'll sure. Allow for that. Okay. Thank you. We may be playing outside, and whoever that would is like okay. to join us may. Mahalo Thank me. you very much. Isaiah Chong, followed by Blade Walsh. And Mr. Walsh will be our final testifier this afternoon. Aloha. Aloha. I, I spoke with you folks uh, back when you were in full council on my merits and concerns on on whom would be affected exactly by the uh, sit and lie bill. So I'm not going to repeat that because I believe you all were there. What I will go on to is the fact that we want to help those without a home, not punish them. One of the chief problems that leads to houselessness is lack of income or unemployment. Now, if we criminalize people, 
as I'm sure you all have in the past applied for jobs, there is a section on the job application that asks you, have you ever been convicted of a crime? Now, if you're an employer and you're looking at it, and you say, gee, this person was convicted of a crime, we don't have a specific box to put whether it was manslaughter, murder, or laying on a sidewalk. They're unable to differentiate of it. So are we to expect the employers to hire someone who has been convicted of a crime of laying down? Laying down on somewhere that they consider to be their bed? Should we criminalize your bedrooms at your homes? Just because these people do not have a permanent home, it's inappropriate for us to penalize them for it. What we need to do is provide them a place to stay. Yes, there's finances involved. Yes, we may or may not have the money to cover it. But is money the only thing we care about in society? If so, this is not the kind of society I want to live in anymore. What we need to worry about is people. Yes, people in Chinatown, in Waikiki, even in my own rural area of Everbeach, we all are affected by those without a home in one way or another. But we cannot, we cannot criminalize them for something that's out of their own doing. No one gets up one day and says, gee, I don't like living in this nice three-bedroom home anymore. I think I'm going to go lay down on River Street. No. There's always an underlying factor that led to homelessness. If we are able to curb the underlying factor, if we're able to treat the matter that led to homelessness, we may be able to remedy it. Be it psychiatric health problems, whether it be it physical health problems, income disparity, there are ways that we can work it out, Mr. Chair and Council Members. There are ways, other than saying, let's write you a ticket even though we know you'll never be able to pay it. Now we write the ticket and this person says, I have no money to pay it, so I guess I'm going to fight it. So they go to court. Now what is the judge to say? Oh, sir, you don't have the money, so we'll throw you in jail? So there went money wasted at the court system. Now money wasted, putting someone without a home in jail. Why in jail? Why not a permanent or even a temporary housing where we try to get them back stabilized? We cannot expect citations to work. We cannot expect the court systems to do something that we as a society need to do. A judge cannot say, oh, by court order, I'm ordering the city to pay your rent. They can't do that. It is the council. It is the legislature. It is you and I who have to work together for the people so that they may have a place to stay, that they will not inconvenience others. They are not, we cannot keep on saying, Mr. Chair, that it inconveniences the tourist. It inconveniences people that are trying to walk by. My mother is wheelchair bound, Mr. Chair. I know that people obstructing the sidewalk can be very hazardous. But what other options do they have? I'm not going to say, oh, why don't you go to the next sidewalk? What problem does that solve? It solves no problem. What they need is a place to stay. When they need it is now. Not next year when we're done building a facility. There is existing buildings that we can use. Ever Beach. We have the Ever Beach fire station that was closed down so that we could open a new fire station. Now that building is sitting idle. I've heard plans of possibly a substation of police, possibly an ambulance station. All those are good and dandy. Let's see what else we can do with empty city buildings and other government controlled and operated buildings Thank that you. are sitting idle. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank I won't you. waste any more of your time. Members, members, any questions for the testifier? If not, thank you. Thank Mr. You. Walsh? Hi there. Good, uh, good afternoon now. Uh, good afternoon, council Mr. members Walsh. and Chairman, An uh, are, are you the chair? Do I address you as the chair, Mr. Anderson? The committee chair. The committee chair. Okay, sure. I'll just say Mr. Anderson. <laughs> it's been a long day. Uh, so first I got to say that I first have to thank Mr. James behind me. I only came here to be an observer, yet it wasn't until uh, his words about going to Thomas Square, meeting with deoccupiers, that kind of, that kind of irked me, that kind of uh, moved me uh, passionately to be able to write, write down some notes and come before you now. So to address that real quick, um, I, uh, I, I did meet a lot of people uh, uh, in my involvement down there at Thomas Square, a lot of uh, houses people as well as a lot of residents in that area. 
And uh, I do understand, uh, you know, being afraid of tents. Uh, change can be scary after all, right? Well, there, there was a lot of emotions that I felt personally when I was there. And when uh, bills like uh, Bill 54 and Bill 7 eventually came down the line, uh, what that mostly did is got a lot of, um, is, it, is it moved out, at least in, in Thomas Square in that perspective, it moved out a lot of uh, uh, us uh, in kind of that activist role from being able to sustain any sort of uh, presence there and p to be able to provide people shelter with tents, food, books, things, things of that sort. Uh, so, I mean, Bill 7 may have gotten rid of that, yet there are still a lot of houseless people who are there today, and though they have less belongings, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't solve the long-term problem of houselessness itself. And I actually do agree with Mr. James in that I do think that we can, we can solve houselessness, we can get rid of it. I think that we can abolish it in poverty as a whole, in general, so that we never have to deal with it again. However, I think that, so to say, closing the door on transplants that come in from, uh, from the United States is, um, that's one method that, that the, that the city and county, that the state can definitely pursue. However, there are examples such as Greece that has taken a, uh, a newfound kind of anti-immigration policy in order to stop the influx of new people and refugees from places like Syria, Egypt, etc., from coming in so they can handle their own affairs. However, people are still coming in and this will continue to happen even if we, there, were try, there were methods to try to regulate the amount of people who were to become houseless or people who are moving onto the island who then become houseless or are already houseless, whatever, that's still going to happen. And so that needs to be addressed right now. Maybe the streets can be made a safer place in general. Uh, to, to summarize, to wrap up, let's see here. Um, I believe that the, the biggest problem is that all of this is very top heavy. A lot of responsibility is falling on you guys and there's already a million and one other things that you guys are doing. Uh, I recently read an article about the Department of Education getting money cut. There's huge construction projects going on all over town. There's all sorts of things going on and then yet at the same time, there has to be new regulations, new administrations for things like this, these sit and lie bills. Um, the continued enforcement of Bill 7, things of that sort. I think what would, what would be more beneficial, what would take ease off of everyone's shoulders is to, is to share that role of leadership, for leadership to rise, or not necessarily rise, but for leaders to come from the ranks of the houses community themselves. So that different houses communities, whatever pocket of the island that they're on, becomes more autonomous in their own right. They know what it is they need and they want to live dignified lives. What would help them is to stop bills like Bill 7 where they have to worry about where they're camping, what time of day it is, and then if, they, if the city does come to try to take their belongings, now they have to start all over again the next day and continue on and on. There Thank you very much. Please summarize. Autonomy, leadership from the ranks. Get rid of this top-heavy structure. It doesn't need to be. It doesn't need to be such a. Uh, it doesn't need to be such a pyramid. We can all see that it's it's really wearing down on the administration. That's that's a lot to deal with, and I and I can understand that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Anderson. Members, any questions? If not, thank you very much. Members, uh, thank you very much for staying with us throughout our proceedings from this morning into this afternoon. Uh, members, we will take the items in the order that they're posted on the agenda. The chair is going to recommend that we defer resolution 14-117 as Director Otto had suggested that proposing land use ordinance amendments to the Waikiki Special District will not be the proper way in which to uh, discuss some of the sidewalk uh, rules and regulations that we are looking at in, in some of the bills that were before us uh, during our meeting today. So that said, again, the chair is going to recommend that we defer resolution 14-117.
Any discussion on the recommendation to defer? Okay, any reservations, objections? Hearing none, so ordered. Resolution 14-117 has been deferred. Okay. Before we get to the other items, members, again, I would like to thank all of you uh, for staying with us into this afternoon. And I'd also like to thank those who took time out of their schedules to be here with us to offer their testimony and to offer their thoughts. I do firmly believe that, in fact, we do need to act as a council. Our citizens and the residents of the city and county of Honolulu expect and deserve no less. We do need to ensure that we continue to provide access to all, to all of our public places. Also, as a matter of public health and safety, the prohibition of urinating and defecating in public and those items that are before us this afternoon need to be taken up as well. What we did, members, I'd like to remind you with Bill 7, uh, that did cause some heartache. Those are difficult decisions to be made. However, I would argue that the situation at Thomas Square is indeed better today than it was before. The area is now open and accessible to all. Our sidewalks now are able to be accessed by all members of the public, including those who rely on access mobility devices, such as our kupuna with walkers and wheelchairs, our parents, mothers, fathers, grandparents, tutus and papa, who are able to access our sidewalks with strollers. People laying on the sidewalks, people with their debris on the sidewalks was the issue. I ran around Thomas Square frequently. So I fully understand exactly what was going on. And the, and, and the access today, I would argue, is a lot better. Within the past month, I attended two conferences in Waikiki. As a father of four young children, I took my children with me to those conferences in Waikiki. We did go out at night and experience Waikiki. My kids love Waikiki. Obviously, I didn't let them go out on their own. I made sure that I accompanied them, as Mr. Egan mentioned, he accompanies his children in Kaka'ako. But I did see firsthand that this council does in fact need to act, that we do need to protect Waikiki. But in doing so, there will be other communities that will demand action and protection as well, as Council Member Kobayashi had mentioned, with her community in Mo'ili'ili, in Manoa, as Council Member Fukunaga had mentioned in her community of Chinatown. With that, members, I will ask that you join me in supporting Bill 42, and I will recommend that Bill 42 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Is there any discussion on the Chair's recommendation? Vice Chair Harimoto. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Certainly, this, this really is a difficult situation we're facing. Um, I agree with most of what you said. Um, you know, if we're given a choice between Bill 45, in fact, Bill, Bill 44 or 45, um, I would choose 42 for various reasons. But however, I do not support implementation of these kinds of measures, as I've said before, until we have more support systems in place, until we have housing first in place, until we have more affordable housing in terms of low-income rentals in place. Because we're not only talking about those who are homeless now. We need to also look a little bit further for those who will become homeless because of various circumstances. As we heard yesterday in our discussion in committee, we have a serious shortage of low-income rental units. There are people just on the verge of becoming homeless. So let's broaden this discussion into the bigger picture of affordable housing. So, you know, I, I think we all understand there's a serious problem. We all understand the implications this has in Waikiki. I don't think there's any one of us who will deny that's in a crisis situation. So 
I agree, we need to do something. But you know, the fact of the matter is that the homeless issue did not develop overnight. This has been brewing and building for years. I would say even decades. And it's reached a crisis situation. But here we are today trying to find a quick fix. I think we are fooling ourselves to think that we can, we can solve this by making this law. And, you know, we talked about this being one part of the solution. Okay, you know, perhaps. But until we have the other parts in place, we cannot move on this. You know, government, I hate to say, government failed for decades in not addressing the homeless situation. And I don't believe for a minute that we can solve it overnight. This is very difficult. You know, here we are talking about making a law to make it illegal to sit and lie on sidewalks. I mean, that's, that's a sorry state of affairs when we need to do that. But it is where we are. But you know, the homeless won't disappear because we make this law. They will not disappear. They'll go somewhere else, maybe. We talk about having space and shelters. But, but we know, I'm not an expert, but we know for a fact that many of these homeless cannot go into shelters. You know, some don't want to, okay, but we know for a fact many cannot go into shelters because they have serious mental issues. They have serious drug addiction issues. So let's not talk about this space in, in homeless shelters, traditional homeless shelters, because that's not the problem. We need to have the services in place the services and housing in place. And you know, earlier I talked about watching the segment on 60 Minutes. And if you haven't seen it, you need to see it. I researched housing first. I know it works. By all accounts, it works. And after watching that 60 Minute segment, I'm convinced we can do this too. But government cannot do it alone. Because the key in that 60 Minute se segment was Partnership from the community and partnership with the businesses. So let's not talk about government doing this or government doing that. We need the business community and the residents in the community to partner with us, to step up to the plate with us. And where we are now, I don't think, in fact, I know we're not there. So we talk about this, the council allocating the millions of dollars for, for Housing First. We talk about the city's plans, which, by the way, to me, there's no way we're going to get this up and running by August. There's no way. But where's the community partnership? Where's the business partnership? This cannot succeed without that in place. So while I understand that there's a, there's a real need to move this forward quickly, there's, there's a crisis before us, we're going to fall flat on our face if we implement this and we think that we can get this in place by August and we think that we can get the communities to support this and we think the businesses will come on board. We need to put all that in place first or even at the very least in conjunction with passing a law like this. We say we know passing a law like this is not the solution by itself, but where's the other pieces? We don't have the commitment and plans, firm plans from the other pieces. And that's what really leads me to believe that this law itself won't do it. Um, and by the way, HCDA, Kaka'ako, could be a, a partner in all of this. We missed the boat. The state missed the boat in not requiring deeper commitments from HCD Kakako in terms of the low income rentals. And I, you know, I, I'm really disturbed about that. But we need the commitment from the Waikiki community, the Waikiki Improvement Association, the Waikiki businesses, the Waikiki residents before we move forward with this. And you know, finally, 
I think it's too easy for us to just dehumanize the, the homeless. I mean, we talk about them as though they're objects. And I'm, you know, perhaps I'm very sensitive about that because, you know, for me, it's, I guess the way I'll put it is, my faith teaches me to have love and compassion for those who cannot help themselves, the poor and the needy. And I just feel like we're, down, we're going down this path of saying we need to solve this problem. And, you know, we're almost neglecting to consider that they're humans too, they're people too. And I think we need to come back to realizing that they are humans too. So all that said, you know, that's where I am. I, I definitely will not support the island-wide ban when it comes to Waikiki. You know, I can understand there's, there's an urgency. But we need the commitment first. And that's my suggested compromise, if you want to call it a compromise. We need to have the commitment from all those that we listed before to say, yes, we're on, we're on board. Yes, we partner with the city, yes, we'll commit resources, and yes, we want housing first in our community. Without that, there is no hope. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Any other remarks on Bill 42, the Chair's recommendation to move Bill 42 out of committee? Council Member Manor. Yes, just really briefly, um, uh, I just wanted to share a brief legal perspective in response to uh, Council Member Harimoto's uh, concerns. The, um, if this bill were to be passed, of course the administration uh, would have a strong interest in uh, wanting to ensure that if there is a legal challenge to the constitutionality of this bill, that the administration would be able to successfully defend it. And so in that regard, uh, the uh, rulings of the U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals that have review reviewed similar ordinances in other municipalities uh, have indicated that one of the things that the city would have to be able to show if this sort of a bill were passed into law is that there is sufficient shelter space to accommodate the um, homeless who might be impacted by the sort of prohibitions that are contained in this particular bill. So in that regard, if this bill were to be passed into law, the passage of this bill would have to occur in tandem and in conjunction with the city's efforts to provide more shelter space and services. And the city administration has expressed uh, uh, their position that if this bill were to be passed into law, that uh, there will be adequate shelter space and services. Otherwise, a bill of this nature could not withstand constitutional scrutiny. So I think that um, the passage of this bill would also you know, go hand in hand with some of the concerns that uh, Councilmember Harimoto has expressed. Okay. Thank you, Councilmember Menor. Any further discussion on Bill 42? If not, do we have any objections? Do we have any reservations? Okay, Bill 42 has been reported out for a second reading and scheduling of a public hearing before the full council, noting the objection of, of Vice Chair Harimoto. Bill 43, prohibiting urinating and defecating in public within the Waikiki Special District. The Chair will recommend that Bill 43 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Any discussion on the Chair's recommendation? Vice Chair Harimoto? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Very briefly. I think we've heard from the administration earlier and the um, Waikiki Improvement Association that um, funding is available to open uh, restrooms in Waikiki. Um, so with that caveat, and perhaps with um, assurances from the administration that Waikiki restrooms will be available and open 24-7, um, I will reluctantly go along with this. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. Any further discussion on the Chair's recommendation to report Bill 43 out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing? Hearing none, no further discussion. Any reservations? Any objections? Bill 43 has been reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Bill 44, prohibiting 
subject to exceptions, persons from sitting or lying on public sidewalks in the downtown Honolulu and Chinatown areas. The chair would like to recommend that Bill 44 be deferred at this time. Uh, Council Member Fukunaga, do you have any remarks you'd like to offer? Thank you. <clears throat> Since you have previously, you know, announced your intention to uh, move out Bill 45. That is my intent. I support your recommendation because it certainly is not, you know, our objective to pit one community against another. The um, introduction of the bill was at the request of many area businesses and residents who were concerned about how they might be impacted by the adoption of Bills 42 and 43. However, I am very sensitive to the fact that other communities, you know, specifically uh, the Makali, uh, Makiki, and Alamoana area, were, which are right between Waikiki and downtown Chinatown, would likely be um, very heavily impacted. I agree with uh, Council Member Harimoto that we do have to ensure that services and housing are available. I would say to the administration, you know, if we can uh, expedite our efforts to make the appropriate forms of housing and services available within all of the communities, then that is really something that we should all be pulling uh, together to achieve. So with that, you know, I um, appreciate your putting Bill 44 on the agenda and uh, hope that if we can work together on Bill 45 that, you know, appropriate safeguards can be included in the bill so that all of uh, the island can gain the necessary assistance and housing services. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Fukunaga. Any further discussion on the Chair's recommendation to defer Bill 44? Seeing no further discussion, any reservations, objections? Hearing none, Bill 44 has been deferred. The chair recommends that Bill 45 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. As the chair mentioned earlier today, and as was confirmed by the administration, this council has appropriated in excess of $45 million to assist with affordable housing and homelessness. In addition, uh, this, the administration has also made a commitment and a firm commitment to work with the council in being able to utilize that appropriation which is a significant one, to be able to implement a solid Housing First initiative as well as housing opportunities for those who are working homeless and homeless with families. And in that regard, I firmly believe that in addition to creating additional incentive for folks not to occupy our public space, that we are in fact working with the administration hand in hand in creating a place for folks to go. So again, members, the chair's recommendation is that Bill 45 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Council Member Menor, <laughs> discussion. You didn't raise my hand yet. You must be a mind reader. <laughs> no, I, uh, I commend you for your efforts in regards to uh, uh, this particular bill. And actually, my comments relate to both uh, Bill 45 and Bill 46. Um, and. Uh, my position basically is I, I do have uh, concerns and uh, significant problems with the uh, bills as they are presently worded. Uh, I think that these measures uh, are well-intentioned uh, and I do support the underlying purpose which is to extend the prohibitions uh, to other communities. Uh, and I too have heard from constituents and residents who feel that the problems that, this, uh, that these bills uh, attempt to address also impact communities uh, outside of uh, Waikiki. Nevertheless, having said that, I believe that the bills as presently worded uh, are overly broad and clearly unconstitutional. The uh, U.S. Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals in reviewing uh, similar ordinances in other municipalities have indicated that these kinds of measures need to include time and geographic boundary restrictions, which these measures do not. Uh, the courts have also indicated that the scope of these particular kinds of measures need to be clearly defined, and uh, I don't believe that these measures accomplish that particular objective. In addition, as I've stated earlier, one of the tests that the city would have to meet uh, in order to be able to successfully defend uh, this, these kinds of measures if uh, they were subjected to legal challenge is that uh, there is sufficient shelter space 
for the homeless who'd be, who would be impacted uh, by uh, the prohibitions that are contained in these bills. And, and so when you expand the scope island-wide, uh, being able to meet that particular test could be problematic uh, for the city. My feeling is that these measures are important, uh, and therefore, uh, if we pass these kinds of measures, we ought to do it right, and we ought to make sure that they can withstand uh, legal challenges, constitutional scrutiny uh, in the future, and I believe as presently worded, uh, the measures don't accomplish that. However, having said that, given the importance of these measures, uh, I would be willing to vote in support, but with reservations. Uh, I'd like to take a stab uh, prior to the next uh, regular council meeting to come up with amendments uh, that could um, uh, strengthen the bill so that if uh, there is a legal challenge to these measures that uh, it could withstand constitutional and, uh, and legal scrutiny. And if the chair uh, is willing to uh, entertain uh, further substantive amendments to these bills, then uh, I would be willing to support uh, the movement of these measures for further discussion, uh, but with reservations. And finally, um, the uh, Deputy Managing Director and uh, Rick Agit have uh, indicated that they uh, are open to the intent of Bills 45 and 46. However, they, they have expressed the concern that uh, even if we move these bills out, the broader bills, that uh, we move the administration's bills, 42 and 43, that would specifically focus on Waik Waikiki, that we move those out separately. And I think that that's uh, a wise and appropriate suggestion on their part, given the fact that if uh, we were to eventually enact uh, Bills 45 and 46 into law, if those uh, bills should face legal challenge and ultimately be struck down, what we would not want happening is for no action to be taken with respect to the homeless issues and problems uh, that affect Waikiki, where we all agree uh, the visitor industry is very important and we need to effectively address uh, those issues in Waikiki down the road. So, uh, based on those concerns, uh, I would be willing to support moving these measures out, but with the understanding, and I believe, uh, well, Chair Anderson has already indicated he is open to further amendments. With that understanding, I, I would support moving these bills out, but uh, with reservations. Thank you, Councilmember Menor. Members, further discussion? No further discussion? Okay, um, let's, he wants to come back. Let's take a uh, short recess and wait for Chair Anderson to return. I believe. Uh, I believe he wants to be here. Yeah. So let's take a, a brief recess until the chair returns. Committee on Zoning and Planning, please come to order.
Is there any further discussion on the chair's recommendation that Bill 45 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing? There being no further discussion, do we have any reservations? Any objections? So noting the objection of Council Member Hari, of Vice Chair Harimoto and the reservations of Council Member Kobayashi and Council Member Menor, Bill 45 has been reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Bill 46, prohibiting urination and defecating in public places. The chair recommends that Bill 46 be reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing. Any discussion on the chair's recommendation? There being no discussion, do we have any reservations? Reservations from Vice Chair Harimoto, Council Member Kobayashi, and Council Member Menor. Do we have, uh, with, with those reservations, there are no objections, I imagine? Bill 46 has been reported out for second reading and scheduling of a public hearing, noting the reservations, Vice Chair Harimoto, Council Member Kobayashi, and Council Member Menor. The final item on our agenda this afternoon is an update from the Director of the Department of Planning and Permitting regarding the status of all pending land use ordinance amendments. Director. Thank you, Chair Anderson. Um, yeah, I circulated the summary of the status of the uh, plan updates and uh, ordinance updates, and so uh, you know, if you have any questions about them, I'd be happy to report on it. Director, could you give the committee an update on the uh, Ko'olau Law, or excuse me, the Ko'olau Poco Sustainable Communities Plan status? Uh, Ko'olau Law? Ko'olau Poco, I'm oh, sorry. Ko'olau Poco. Oh, oh, please. Yeah, that's, uh, that's in the, um, I guess th this summer we were, sp we were in the process of ch uh, working on a public re review draft. And so if, if we can uh, complete it by August, we'll, tr we'll try to um, circulate that and then it, if uh, w once we hit that schedule, then hopefully there'll be a transmittal to council in the spring. So you expect that the Ko'olau Poco Sustainable Communities Plan will be transmitted to council this summer? Uh, no, it's springtime. Next, uh, next, spr next, spring, next, next spring. Next spring. Spring 2015. Yes. So March, April, roughly. Mm, I, I would say that's a, a, a good, good estimate of the time frame. Okay. Thank you. Mm. Uh, it, it, Members, do you have any questions regarding the director's uh, report? Okay. Is there anyone here who would like to testify on the director's report? If not, members, thank you very much for your support and uh, for your perseverance. I'd also like to thank all of the members of the administration who are here, as well as those who took time out of their busy schedules to share their mana'o with us from this morning into this afternoon. There being no further business before the... Everybody was permitted to speak to them uh, in, in the matter that they chose to. I heard them all at the same time, so people people were allowed to come up. They could have spoke about any one of them at any time. So I could have come up three times to speak on each. You could have come up once and spoken on all matters at the same time. That doesn't answer my question. Could have I come up? Could I have my time for each individual bill? Yes. Okay. Yes. There being no further business before the Committee on Zoning and Planning, members, we are adjourned. Thank you. Transportation.